think follow my own advice. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate your indulgence at 6.02. And I call the meeting to order. Okay, good. I was supposed to check to make sure if we had too much of, too much of a crowd to have you all be safe, and you are, so that's life is good. Um, we will now have a moment of reflection and a Pledge of Allegiance by Lucy. Thank you, Lucy. Um, board, I need to have the agenda adopted. Just do I have a motion? Move to um, <laughs> accept the, the agenda as presented. Second. <laughs> Sorry. It was moved by Ms. Black and seconded by Ms. Anderson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain. Abstain. Thank you. It was an A word and it was just lost in my head. Um, it passes. We've been here since 3 o'clock in meetings, so we just want you to know we have to get yeah. into the groove. <laughs> I have to get back into the groove. Alrighty, adoption of the mi minutes on March 26th and April 16th. Do I hear a motion? Move adoption of the minutes. Second. Mrs. Yelsey moved. Ms. Black seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain? Thank you. Recognition. Ms. Olson. Yes, thank you very much. And I would, <clears throat> one, first of all, like to thank Kristen Clark, our director of classified personnel, who has been working very diligently on putting this together. And I will call her to the podium. President Matoy, members of the Board of Education, Dr. Navarro, tonight we are recognizing three classified employees as part of the California Classified School Employee of the Year program. The overall purpose of the program is to recognize the contributions classified employees make in creating a positive school environment where students can thrive. Classified employees are vital members of our school community and play key roles in providing a safe, supportive, and enriching learning environment for our students. This evening, we're also joined by Personnel Commissioner Susan Meyer and Tris Ailey, who will be assisting the board in honoring our Newport Mesa Classified School Employees of the Year. So I'll ask, oh, there you are, okay. And then, all right, so our first uh, category is Newport Mesa's em Classified Employee of the Year from the Child Nutrition category brings a wide and deep range of skills, abilities, and experience, along with a calm, composed, and unflappable leadership style. Managing the day-to-day -day operations of a bustling central kitchen and its frenetic pace with poise, grace, and a quiet lead-by-example manner is just the beginning of this employee's capabilities. Analytical, efficient, and meticulous. She's always seeking ways to improve kitchen operations. Utilizing her past experience as a math teacher, she knows exactly how much of each ingredient to order to ensure that no food goes to waste. One of her most popular creations is an Asian chicken salad that features her own recipe for sesame vinaigrette dressing. It is good. She strives for the highest level of quality and awards of excellence from the Orange County Healthcare Agency, Our Routine. In addition, she can often be found working with students from our school to employment program, assisting interns on her own time, or carefully explaining job duties and responsibilities to new employees. Exceeding expectations has been her calling card for nearly 20 years with the district. Congratulations, Nutrition Service Assistant, to my lamb.
Susan Meyer, you want to come help? All right. <clears throat> kind, caring, and consistent barely scratches the surface of what Newport Mesa's Classified Employee of the Year in the paraeducator and instructional assistant category unceasingly brings to her job. Importantly and impressively, she sees the bigger picture of her role with the students, parents, teacher, and school district in improving the quality of life of everyone involved in the process. She recognizes that building positive relationships with students and parents engenders mutual understanding and trust, and that positive and informed input from all is essential for student success. Everything flows from this understanding. She deeply cares about the success and happiness of each student, bringing in special treats for the class when students reach their goals, organizing class art projects, and making handcrafted gifts for each child. With infectious enthusiasm, she is a fierce advocate and irrepressible cheerleader of her students, who is widely re recognized as one of the best of the best in her field. Congratulations, Special Education <laughs> Instructional Assistant, Tabitha Strange. Mesa's Classified Employee of the Year from the Transportation category treats his job as a complete commitment to the mission of educating and encouraging students. With keen insight, he recognizes that the bus is an extension of both the classroom and the home as he builds a trusting relationship with students, parents, and coworkers. He embraces the opportunity to work with special needs students and has earned great admiration and respect from all who cross his path. With his dedication, passion, communication skills, and perceptiveness. One example of the utilization of these skills involved a special needs student in a wheelchair who struggled to communicate why he wanted to stop for just one moment at the top of the chairlift while being loaded into the school bus. Through observation and insight, he realized the student simply wanted to view the world from the perspective of a person standing. And he was able to provide the opportunity for the student to enjoy that vantage point. In addition to his regular duties, he participates in the Bus in the Classroom program that teaches students with special needs lifelong skills and independent mobility, has dressed as Santa Claus for Killybrook students, coaches and trains new drivers, and mentors high school students in his own community. The district is proud to recognize this outstanding employee. Congratulations, school bus cover driver Scott Parks. And finally, I just want to thank the Board of Education, Dr. Navarro, and of course the Personnel Commission for your commitment to this important program and the opportunity to congratulate and recognize our 2019 Newport Mesa Classified Employees of the Year. So thank you. Just as a clarification so that you don't think I've totally lost my mind, today was Bus Driver Appreciation Day, <laughs> and they had a giant big top, mm -hmm. and they created a whole circus. So everyone got a red nose mm -hmm. to participate and be part of their circus. Wow. 
because sometimes it's like a circus. So that's why we had our noses. Thank you very much. Now it gives me great honor, which I had before too, to recognize our winter athletic champions and Mr. Drake and Dr. Haley. Mr. Barmeister, it says. Oh. <laughs> M &O. Okay. M &O, yeah. There you go. <laughs> President Matoya, members Thank of you. the board, Dr. Navarro, cabinet, and distinguished guests. Tonight we will be recognizing our winter CIF champions, the Costa Mesa High School cheer squad. The 2018-19 Costa Mesa High School cheer team made history in winning a championship in the inaugural season of cheer as a CIF competitive sport. There are many more impressive cred credentials for this squad, which we'll save for their coach to share with you. <laughs> Suffice to say that Costa Mesa High School not only sets the standard for our district, but in the state and our perennial national championship contenders. A squad that is near and dear to my heart because my daughter was a Costa Mesa High School cheerleader under Coach Johnson. With that, I will introduce Principal Haley to say a few words and introduce his coach. Great. Yes, good evening, uh, President Matoye, members of the board, executive cabinet, distinguished <laughs> guests. Uh, it's an honor to be here to uh, talk about our cheer team and uh, our, our coach of 15 years. Uh, when you really look at uh, the record that she's been able to compile in that 15 years, uh, as you heard Dr. Baumeister say, it is tough to find anywhere else in the nation that's getting the accolades and the results, as well as developing really solid people uh, throughout the six years that they're part of our program in both middle school and high school. So you, you, you kind of heard um, that uh, she is not only our cheer coach, she's our spirit programs director, head coach, and our stunt coach. She's been at our school for 15 years. Uh, last night, we just solidified our league title for stunt. So we went undefeated in our league. Uh, you bet. Uh, we're here to celebrate the Division Four championships uh, in co-ed cheer. Uh, you're seeing these white coats for a reason because also they competed at nationals uh, and they not only won one coat, but they won two coats at that national competition in Florida against over 900 schools. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our, our cheer coach and director of the program, uh, Corrine Johnson. Come on up. Thank Dr. Navarro and President Montoya and the entire school board and all the executive cabinet for having us and recognizing us. I know this kind of seems like an annual tradition and we want to keep it going and we, we do this. Um, again, I want to just say what an amazing team this is. Um, first year recognized as CIF sport and we won the CIF title, bringing a first CIF title back to Costa Mesa in 20 years. Um, we also went to Florida and competed what you see on ESPN, um, over 900 schools and we took home. We were the only school in California to win nationals and we were the only school to to bring home two jackets in two different divisions with the same exact team. So amazing. And right after that, we went into stunt season. Just like Dr. Haley said, we won league last night. We go to playoffs this Friday and hopefully a bid to state next week. So very proud of this Get team. Ready, Jeff. Um, they're amazing. These <laughs> girls have been with me since they were in kindergarten doing youth clinics all the way up. So um, I'd like to introduce to them to you. Um, we have several. There's a band concert tonight, as you know, and several are also in band. Um, they do a lot of different things, these cheerleaders. So um, first up, we have Kamea Binquist. <laughs> Jolina Castaneda. Liana <laughs> Hallman. In the we did. They're all the I band. Know. That's okay. Well, apparently, a bunch of middle names. Riley and there you are. Well, of course, we're the same. Congratulations, <laughs> Okay, you guys are gonna have to take two rows. <laughs> Take pictures, it's okay. Yeah. Don't be shy. Take, take all the pictures you want. 
Way cool. I know, right? Super Bowl. Pretty cool. Other girls, thank you so much. I mean, I, I expected you guys to do flips all the way up. <laughs> we should probably have their parents um, ask their parents to stand and be recognized because we know it's a lot of work on their part okay. too. So. Exactly. Are, do we have parents of the girls okay. in the? I'm, well, or they couldn't find parents parking. that weren't taking pictures. <laughs> Are there any parents that didn't rush up? Congratulations, parents! I yep. know the devotion that you had to do not only with time and and helping the girls get to where they did, and trusting them to go across the country to win mm -hmm. for the for themselves and for the district. Quite an accomplishment. We're going to take a short recess for the reception for our mm -hmm. award winners, both okay. classified employees and our girls, mm -hmm. and then we will come right back. It is 6.19. We will start 10 minutes from now. Exactly at 6.30. Okay. Probably. <laughs> at this time, I need to do a readout from um, closed session. In closed session, the Board of Education took action to approve the dismissal of classified employee number 201905HR, <laughs> effective April 23rd, 2019. The roll call vote was as follows, seven ayes, no noes, no abstain, no absent. Thank you, now we get to have more good stuff. Um, we are going to do our student board member reports and we'll be beginning with Lucy, thank you. Good evening. I'm Lucy Dimitrik, representing Early College High School. Um, starting tomorrow, our juniors will begin the standardized testing for CASP. Uh, testing will occur over the course of three weeks at ECHS, with week one focusing on language arts, week two focusing on life science, and week three on mathematics. Dr. Martinez, our principal, held a junior class rally lunch meeting today as an opportunity to encourage our students on these exams as they were all treated to free pizza from Little Caesars. On April 8th, we will, we were officially, sorry, um, we officially received our school's 2019 California Distinguished School Award, Yay. which we are very Yay. proud. Yay. <laughs> um, we would like to thank Board <coughs> President Matoy um, and Executive Director of Secondary Education, Dr. Kirk Bauermeister, for attending the award ceremony and dinner on April 5th with our principal, Dr. Martinez. We also thank you for the support that you have given ECHS over the years in order to allow our students, staff, and families to distinguish themselves. Mm -hmm. On April 12th, we held our second student shadow day of the year, and it went pretty well. It was an opportunity for applicants to visit our school um, during their spring break, as well as attending a presentation with our freshmen held by our college partner, Coastline Community College. Information was shared on what year five can look like for ECHS students who opt to enter sorry, who opt to not enter a four-year four -year university upon graduation, but you can complete their I get C in year five at Coastline completely free, then transfer as a junior to a UC or Cal State the following fall. This Saturday, we are extremely excited about our prom, which will be held through the electric cruises in Newport Beach. Mm -hmm. The theme this year is Old Hollywood, so we will be rolling out the red carpet on a yacht. <laughs> Um, next week, Wednesday, May 1st, we'll be hosting our last ECHS information night at 6.30 p.m. Um, in room one. Our regular application deadline for prospective <coughs> students is Friday, May 3rd. Lastly, in two weeks, on May 7th, we'll be holding a college signing day for our seniors during lunch. This is the first time that we will be holding this event on our campus, so we are very excited for our seniors to officially announce where they will be going, and we are happy to celebrate where they will be attending next fall. Thank you. Thank you very much. Isaiah. Are you going to mention your name? Good evening. I'm Isaiah Murphy from Costa Mesa High School. And after my report, I'm also going to be reading out Rafael Torres, who couldn't oh. make it because of car problems. Oh, <laughs> thank you. 
So in terms of academics, our AP classes are now in full test prep mode with, as Raphael will mention later on, our AP Calculus students are participating in the review sessions that Mr. Clay at Newport Harbor holds, which is four consecutive Saturdays from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m., taking an entire AP Calculus test and reviewing each question individually and explaining how to do it. <laughs> it's incredible, and I don't know how Mr. Clay does that, but it's also incredibly helpful, so we're very thankful for him for that. And uh, at the beginning of April, the top 16 students from our graduating class were informed that they would be receiving the Les Miller Award, uh -huh. and we were all very humbled to accept that honor. In terms of academics or uh, athletics, golf it will be playing against Estancia tonight, and varsity baseball will be playing against Calvary Chapel tonight. Our first event, uh, prior event, was just this past Friday, our elections for ASB were held, and it was a big success. And uh, uh, the Lunch and Learn held by the College and Career Center was held at our library for computer sciences mm. for all those students interested in that career. And upcoming on April 29th, fall 2019, ROP registration begins. And our second event, on May 1st, our school has been given the amazing opportunity to attend the College Signing Day celebration at UCLA, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Michelle Obama is actually going to be there giving a speech oh. for all those seniors uh, signing on for college. Yeah. I signed up right away as soon as I found out about <laughs> that. And then uh, tomorrow, our NHS National Honor Society will be holding our induction ceremony for all of our new members. Oh, great. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you, and great. now to and now, Raphael, Raphael mode. Raphael. <laughs> <Yeah>. For, <laughs> not done yet. For Newport Harbor, in terms of academic updates, again, our AP Calculus students began their reviews with Mr. Clay, mm -hmm. as we heard about those four tests. It's amazing. He's amazing for doing that. And all my senior class has been posting their college decisions, and it has been so exciting to see where we are as a senior class and where we're going next year. In terms of recent events, they're holding the Grade Wars, which is a rally uh, between each of the classes to see who has the highest GPA. <laughs> and this year, juniors won. The seniors sadly came in second, according to Raphael. <laughs> They had an ASB meeting this past week regarding the application process for those wanting to be an ASB the next year. And seeing all the bright and excited faces of those applying brought him joy because he was in their same shoes last year. <laughs> and their annual Bridges Speed Friendships event took place on uh, April 18th. This event is used to promote unity amongst students on campus through getting to know one another. They understand that in the campus of 2,000 plus students, it's difficult to get to know everyone, so it's been a great pleasure to be a part of and planning this event. In the Heights, the musical had their first weekend uh, of shows this past weekend. This is our first bilingual play that Newport Harbor holds, so it means a lot to me and my friends who are both Spanish and English speaking. And it's and great. It's fabulous. <laughs> yeah, it's also a very good show. <laughs> And they had an academic rally this Friday where students were awarded for their excellence in specific subject areas. The theme of the rally was sky is the limit. And in upcoming events, cultural week planning is happening right now in ASB. They have contacted many clubs on campus to see if they would like to help with the planning. Mm -hmm. And that is all from Newport Harbor. Wow. Thank, Thank you. you. And for our audience's edification, Rafael Arias Torres, was one of the Angels Avid Scholarship winners. And for those of you that think, oh, how nice, it's a full ride to Northeastern University in Boston. Wow. A four-year full ride. Yes. <laughs> yes. And there are two more students, and I didn't know if Dr. Bauermeister was going to mention them. mention them right now, but you can do it no. in your <laughs> report. <laughs> There's two more students from early college high school that got the same, not necessarily to the same college. So it's almost unheard of to have Four, three yeah. students from one school district. Mm -hmm. So, whoa, not one of mine. <clears throat> Wish that would have happened, but oh well. <laughs> so yay, student board members. Yay. And Alex, I'm sorry, it's kind of hard to follow. <laughs> That's not easy. He it's has, he's, no, he has lots of good things to say. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Nolan Rhodes, and I'll be speaking on behalf of Alex Thank you. You didn't look right, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's all right. Um, this past Monday, we had a college fair with over 160 colleges um, at lunch. Wow. 
And this was open to all students from all grades, and it was a wide variety of colleges. Um, this week is a huge week for our athletic teams. Our boys' tennis team has their individual um, individuals for league after winning the Sunset League with an undefeated record. Our baseball, softball, and boys' volleyball teams also have a game tonight against Laguna Beach. Over spring break, our speech and debate program had its annual spring state co uh, competition in Los Angeles, and the Sea Kings brought home four Best Speaker Awards wow. from this statewide event. Mm -hmm. That's so great. Today, we had our annual Earth Day Fair, which involves classes and student organizations around campus to bring awareness to the safe environmental practices and appreciation of the Earth. <laughs> and lastly, we had our Challenge Success speaker, Dr. Pope. She spoke to our parents last night in our theater, and she spoke to our faculty on Monday morning. That's all that I have. Great. Thank you. <laughs> That's Thank That's you so much for subbing. <laughs> all righty. I didn't miss anyone. That's wonderful. Harbor Council PTA, Mrs. Link. Hi. Good evening, President Matoye, Dr. Navarro, board members and cabinet and guests. Um, our parent education series on April 3rd was held at Newport Harbor High School and we had about 60 parents in attendance. Mm -hmm. The topic was ways to keep your children ba balanced. And the presentation covered identifying mental health risk factors, warning signs and stressors among a lot of other stuff, learning how to have a conversation with your child about suicide and safety. But I wanna mention something that I thought was really unique is, is um, we had a lot of uh, questions regarding the social media. Mm -hmm. And one parent um, spoke up and gave a big shout out to the challenge success. So that's a big mm -hmm. kudos that, that parents in the whole district are hearing messages like this, so I think that's wonderful. Our last parent ed meeting series is, will be at Estancia High School on May 8th, and the topic will be family resilience during tough times, mm. including divorce. So, um, and then on another note, um, Harbor Council, we have a different awards, and uh, one of our awards was the 100% Teacher Membership Challenge Drawing Award. We had four schools that qualified for oh, it, which wow. were STEP, Early College High School, Back Bay, and Newport Heights. And so we had a drawing at our last um, PTA meeting, and STEP was uh, was drawn, oh, wow. and they got $125 to spend towards Yay. teacher appreciation breakfast. Oh, so wow. that was real nice. And uh, my last thing, you know, we're gearing up for our Honorary Service Awards uh, banquet, which is on May 6th. And uh, our committee is hard at work reading through all the honorary service nomination forms, and we're looking forward to presenting it and have, having all of you there. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. <coughs> and now we have a report, and Mr. Drake. Yes, and I'd like to call Dr. Jake Haley uh, up to the uh, podium. This is the second of two reports uh, on intervention. Uh, Dr. Haley's done a, an incredible job at uh, Costa Mesa High School, really diagnosing and prescribing uh, intervention for those kids who need uh, literacy support. So I'm gonna turn it on over to Dr. Haley. Thank you, John, and good evening again. And I'd like to have Yvonne Marvin come up. She's gonna present and you'll learn a little bit more about her. And uh, I know that she also spent some time at Costa Mesa when Dr. Navarro was her principal. So <laughs> she was just for sharing stories. Still yes, <laughs> yes, we keep, we keep the great ones. So, um, so before I start and really kind of dive into the data, I, I do want you to know that I, I gave you a ton of information in, in the board report um, that is far more than 15 minutes and that was intentional because I do want you to look through it was great, by the way. Thank some you. of your own conclusions, but I'll summarize <laughs> some of that as we go along and really want to talk about the instructional deliveries that are happening in the classroom, the why behind those and kind of how we're kind of seeing some growth and gains and what that growth looks like. And then other mm -hmm. things, we, we could ask some questions at the end. But I'll start uh, just kind of reviewing our CASP data for language arts at our uh, junior year level, which isn't in your report. And 50% of our students, uh, juniors now, now are seniors, uh, passed and, and, and re received, uh, met, or exceeded expectations. Uh, we have 32% who nearly met. And these are the conversations that really start to drive your instructional delivery and supports for students is, all right, 32% who nearly met, and then thank you, Wendy. Wendy's got a dashboard that we have access to which shows the correlation <laughs> of students who are two or more years behind in their reading and how they're performing on this test. And these are the conversations I have with John, and believe me that when you look at that data, 
people who are two or more years behind grade level aren't performing well. They're getting maybe to that nearly met or they're, they're, they're behind that more. And so the question becomes, what can we do to help accelerate that so they get closer to reading level earlier? So a lot of our interventions that are school and the luxury of a 712 campus and just kind of overarching educational philosophy is the earlier you can give those supports, right, the greater your growth. So plant your garden and watch it grow. And that's really kind of what we're going to talk about as we dive through. I know you got to hear from Dr. Hogard uh, a couple of weeks ago. She talked through district priorities, of course, of our academics, our behavior, and our community. Just like her presentation, this is in line with, uh, with our A2 for district priorities, just really focusing on high quality instruction for our students. It also really focuses on this RTI model, which all of our schools embed, and that's really to make sure that we're looking and focusing where we need to on some targeted interventions. I just mentioned that we had about 32% of our students, right, who were close to meeting that level, so that would be a targeted inter intervention to really help them get to our goal of all students are graduating college and career ready. So we look at data. We look at lots of data, and that data uh, goes through. And the symbol that I have here is that triangulation of data. It's never a single data point. It's, it's uh, both uh, conversations that you have with your feeder schools. It's conversations that you're having um, with uh, your colleagues, as well as your teachers, to really get a, a sense and a gain for our students, as well as test scores, as well as um, grade distribution, as well as attendance, you name that. And then the circle really represents the not leave it alone and be static, right? To always come back to that and kind of the monitor and progress. And then, of course, embedded with that is that foundation of teacher supports and then really setting, and you're going to hear from Yvonne, about those goals and expectations and kind of changing that mindset for students who maybe need to get over that hurdle. So it's kind of a small slide, but it's an important one because all of our students uh, at our school, uh, seventh through 11th grade, take the STAR test, right? And we're going to see growth of that. And if you're not familiar with that test, it gives you several data points that you're able to look at and compare throughout the year, and they're important data sets. And as principals, we'll, we'll, we'll talk and we'll get into the weeds of some of those columns more uh, than other columns. And a lot of it is some national norms. It'll compare our students nationally so we kind of know how we're how we're doing and what our marks are working on and then gives us kind of some growth as we're getting through the school year so we really know that what we've been doing either targeted or just in general instruction has been effective uh, our, our goal again is to see growth in all of our students and really be able to measure that growth so I kind of highlighted just a just a student there this is actually from one of our reading uh, reading classes at a ninth grade level and it's showing our top student and I'll kind of focus on kind of those columns in that class so these are students that we already identified coming in that we knew through those conversations and through data sets that we knew that we hey if we give some supports they're going to get to that finish line uh, a little quicker so if you look at our top students and you, you kind of come across that line and you see that number one in the rank column which is pretty self-explanatory you come over and you're going to see that they are in a Lexile range which we're going to talk a lot about of a high of 1255 but really <laughs> about a 1205 it gives grade level equivalency for that student right around a, what, 7.8. So about a year behind. So that's the top in the class. So then you start to, again, go from there that you've got a wide variance of students that are in that mm -hmm. class. Obviously, not obviously, but I think what we're seeing, and it makes a lot of sense, that if you are multiple years behind, your growth has an opportunity to be even more exponential than those who are maybe just mm -hmm. a single year behind, because yeah. uh, that gap is larger, <laughs> bless you. <laughs> So, so here, here's a little bit into the weeds, and then I'm going to turn it over to Yvonne, who really has uh, a, a lot of the, the good instructional stuff. So here, here's the grid that we're looking at, which is really breaking down those Lexile levels per grade level of where students are and kind of the levels that they should be, should, that, that they should be in. And so looking here, I took a snapshot of that reading class, again, multiple measures, and just kind of looking through the Lexile levels of kind of where those students are at the beginning of the year. This, as you can see, was taken either in September or October, depending when kids came into the class. And you start looking down that column of the Lexile level. Um, it gives you a graphic to the right, which shows you that all students in that class except for one are below basic. You can go to the left, and you could look at that, and you can see our right. What does that mean for that student and kind of below basic at what level? And then you can come up with your own conclusions, all right? Looking off that data, I see that they're at a third grade reading level or whatever level they might be. And then we get into the, all right, how can we promote, right, healthy habits and really kind of make sure that we're changing that mindset, that growth mindset, and really try to get students to accelerate faster than they would uh, without having kind of that targeted intervention and conversation. 
So our guiding question is all right. We're recognizing that we have students that are behind in reading level. Um, so what can we do about it? And this is again where I, I really appreciate uh, the supports of the district in conversations with John, with Dr. Baumeister, um, with with Russell, and then going into Vanessa of like how can we be intentional about what we might do. And so this is year two for us, and really, really kind of diving in. And then you learn that when uh, your superintendent hires great people, you start asking questions about what else have you done. Uh, you've been language arts chair for our school, you've been there for 18 years and has a passion for reading support. And you really start to learn about that passion and really that's an area of expertise you can rely on. Plus uh, you look at kind of her creative background, loves dance, she was in our dancing with the teachers, uh, skateboarding, <laughs> roller skating, connects well with kids. It was a natural marriage for program. Um, it was kind of let's have her guide and uh, deliver and kind of support the teachers. Um, so we were lucky to have an ace uh, and so you mm -hmm. really start to see the excellence in the classroom and you'll see some growth data as we dive in and I turn it over to the masterful Yvonne Marvin <laughs> okay so this is the second year I've been doing the reading intervention classes and we're using a program called read 180 which we our district adopted and um, I'm talking about um, the kids that come into the class and they've already been um, identified as two grade levels below their reading level. And the first thing we do is tackle the idea of mindset and growth mindset versus fixed mindset because we're dealing with a student population where they've been in the cycle and they've kind of just slipped through the cracks and they think they're stuck that way. So they are the three to five kids in, every, in mainstream classes that, that the teacher can't wait for because they have to keep going and teaching and they don't have the time in the school year to specialize um, instruction for those handful of kids. So in the reading intervention classes, we have a whole class of these kids. So you can imagine what a challenge that is to teach a group of kids like this, but also that the whole class has this mindset of this is where I'm at. I hate reading. I don't even care about school. And what am I doing in this class? I hate this class. Can I get out? And so we talk <laughs> about mindset and we kind of move them toward, you know, having that growth mindset because that is going to help them achieve their, their, their life that they want to have in the future. So after that, um, we talk, we um, introduce an assessment called the reading inventory that's in the um, the Read 180 program, and it is, if you remember the chart on the previous slide, it's the one that determines what the student's lexile level is and their reading level, whether they're mm. below basic, basic, proficient, or advanced. And if you remember all those red dots that you saw, that was a lot of students that were below basic the first time they took the reading inventory. And so what we, um, when, if they are way below and their lexile level is, for example, 600 or below, then um, um, the program allows them to be assessed even further. Did they miss something in second grade and they don't understand phonics? So they can branch out and do a phonics inventory to see what kind of decoders there are. So there's all these diff different levels of assessments so we can give them what they need to become better readers. So if they... Um, are still pre-decoders or beginning decoders, they're um, in a program called System 44, and that's a separate student application on the computer. Um, if they are above 600, they do the Read 180 program, and that's the student app in, on the computer as well. And once they are plugged into where they should be, um, the class works um, with three rotations, so we can really um, um, it's, it's not 90 minutes of teaching them reading. There's a lot of different activities to help build all those components that they are struggling with. So if you look at the um, circles on the right, there's a rotation for student application, and that is a, a individualized program that they do on the computer is 20 minutes max. So they have to intently focus on their work, and the program feeds them um, activities, strategies that they need to work on based on the assessment. So it's it's individualized instruction that the teacher doesn't have to develop, um, and then small group learning is where I can pull certain. Uh, 
groups of students and have that focused uh, delivery of skills lessons that they missed and I get that information based on the data of their assessments so I can differentiate for this group of kids versus that group of kids. And then the third rotation is independent reading. So they choose a Read 180 book according to their Lexile and according to their interest. So there's a vast library, there's also ebooks and e-reads, so the, the point is get them reading, but get them reading on their Lexile level based on the results of the reading inventory. And then, um, this is an example of how a 90 minute block period works in the class. We start with the whole group lesson and no matter what their lexiles are, they all participate in the whole group lesson. The maximum reading that we do is two pages, but it's two pages of really analyzing the text, giving them the skills of how to interpret theme, characters, etc. All the things that you would think they, may ha they should have gotten in their English classes but that they're struggling with. It introduces new vocabulary. We have choral reading where the teacher leaves out a word and they have to say it mm. and we tell them right at the beginning, this is the model. I have to hear all of you reading and it takes a while for the class to buy into that and to participate <laughs> but I'm telling them I need to see is your response delayed because you're listening to the person next to you read or do you can you uh. really understand the word and so they know I'm grading this I walk around with a clipboard while I'm reading <laughs> and while I listen to them and so this is the expectation that has never really been put on them and actually monitored as closely so in the whole group lesson they also do a do now where they predict check predictions show that they know a new vocabulary word or concept that we had previously worked on and we do that at the beginning of every period and then we start our rotations so there's 20 minute rotations and depending on what I need to do with with the groups of kids I will have them grouped differently so in my class it's superhero themes so I have Wonder Woman group they're my lower readers um, then I have Spider-Man and Hulk and they don't know that they're they're low, middle, and high because those groups are fluid, but with my low readers, I can really focus in on delivering the skills that they need because the assessment data shows that they struggle with multiple meaning words. So I could deliver a lesson just for those kids on multiple meaning words, and I might not need to do that same lesson with the next group. So they spend, um, they go to their stations, and the one where I'm with the kids, I have like six or seven kids, and so they don't have that opportunity to put their head down, to pretend they don't exist, <laughs> <laughs> I can call on them and I'm asking them to participate and I see them doing their work uh, while the another group is doing independent reading and there's a couch and pillows that they get to sit um, sit around and read and then the third group they're doing their student app the individualized computer program and then we come back at the end of the class and we do a wrap-up where we talk about building community how has someone supported you today what's a question you still have about what we learned or what we talked about and so there's like the whole group the rotations and the whole group so I think that structure really promotes learning especially with with these kids here's an, um, some pictures of the ideal uh, reading intervention classroom. This is not my classroom. Uh, there, are two, there are two pictures from my classroom, but um, it's a welcoming, comfortable environment. It's not just rows of desks where they're kind of just one kid among 30 to 40 kids in the class. Um, there's that's what an example of the small group rotation looks like where there's a teacher and there's maybe four to five to six kids. The, the bigger the groups are, because it's pretty much a classroom divided by three, the harder it is to really um, have that small group interaction with them. And it's also harder to monitor students who are doing their independent work because I'm trying to deliver a specific lesson and I'm like, okay, don't, don't be asleep, wake up. Are you on the right <laughs> website? You know, so uh, the smaller group are manageable to have this rotation model and still deliver that specialized instruction. And then there's example of a nice comfortable couch area and a computer station and then the Read 180 libraries uh, for Read 180 and System 44 that are in the classroom. Um, uh, this is data from my current six period class and if you just look at the colors, I know the fine print is hard to read, but the first test nope, represents okay. when they took it, the reading inventory in October. And if you just look at the red and the yellows and the green, and then this last <laughs> test they took last week. So um, wow. you could see that a lot of kids, the red represents below basic. They moved in just seven months from below basic to basic, and some kids moved up to basic to proficient, <coughs> and several <coughs> moved up to um, advanced. And so this is with using all the data we get, and I know I just, um, we talked about Lexile scores, but we get data from their student app. What's 
zones are they struggling in? Is it vocabulary, reading, writing? Um, so it, it's instantaneous. When they do that, I could run a report and I could see where they're at. So it's really um, an, a great tool to have because I wouldn't be able to, to know exactly where they at, they're at if I'm just running this like an English class, for example. Um, and then this, this is that same class, and you can see that um, after giving them specific instruction based on their assessments on what they need, and we spend a few weeks on this in small group, you can see that um, that's their first attempt on the left, their last attempt on the right, and you can see the dots changing, right? But you can also see that there's an expected growth and then their actual growth. So the average growth of Lexile in this class was 124 Lexile points. Wow. And if you look at the expected growth, some, they, most students exceeded their expected growth. And so this was based on their expected growth based um, um, on how they're doing in their app, how they're doing on their reading, their independent reading. And, and their mm -hmm. projected growth was 25 to 50, 40 to 75, and they're growing like 150 um, 278 Lexal points in, wow. in seven months. So I think that this program is very effective. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. So uh, wow. here's our sections. We're currently running eight sections, which uh, is also we're running in special ed. That classroom that she showed is our special education classroom that teachers did a marvelous job of really creating a comfortable environment where students want to come in and read. Um, we're really noticing that that has made a huge difference. In our high school groups, uh, we're seeing the same. In fact, we're seeing kind of a little bit more of an exponential growth than what was shared. Uh, where you're seeing about 75 to, I'd say, 90% of the class for middle school is showing, you know, some great growth. At the high school, it's a little less. We're probably showing uh, around 70% of our class. But the growth that we're seeing, because some kids are identified at a second grade level, we're seeing, like, Lexile jumps of up to 500 points of just amazing wow. numbers of really kids just mm -hmm. needing some targeted um, discussions that's really helping to guide their learning, and you're starting to see them through us. Uh, flourish. I have done great comparisons too. Like, okay, how is this transforming? Um, and as you can imagine, uh, it's not a consistent formula, right? But we are seeing uh, changes in marks in their other classes, so it is starting to carry over. Um, and just celebrating the growth, though, that growth mindset that, hey, listen, you were at, you know, a kindergarten level, and I want you to celebrate that now you're reading at the fifth grade level. That's five grade levels, right? But you're still trying to access ninth grade content, mm -hmm. right? So that's where the marriage of those come through. But with another year, you're really optimistic that they can get there. I can say we have a student who's got all A's. I looked at his data the other day, um, and he's shown a growth of about 400 Lexile points, and he's all A's in every class. So wow. like, wow, okay, so there are, you know, a, a variance of how they're achieving. Lessons learned, I'm not gonna read through it. I'll just summarize. The biggest and most important is really be intentional about your class size. As you heard Yvonne say, when they start to grow too big, because you think, wow, this is so great, it becomes unable to manage. Or if you are going to have larger class sizes, have some support in there so you have extra eyes to kind of go through. Um, the other is just that importance of creating uh, a comfortable learning environment for them that's different than a classroom. When kids were just seated in rows, which was kind of our, our last year model as we were kind of coming out, they didn't read as much. And now that we have these really comfortable environments, they almost like run in because they want the golden you know, chair that they love to sit in and they want to be first. So they grab their book and they go read right away. And it's just fabulous to watch. So really be intentional and really try to support uh, what that vision and transformation uh, looks like. We're finding more success in the morning than we are uh, in the afternoon uh, with our gains. In fact, uh, a pretty significant number and amount. Um, and then just really kind of be intentional in ordering in the spring. So come uh, September, we're ready to roll. Um, you know, we were trying to order a little bit into June, July, and things got delayed. So that was problematic. Cool. That's it uh, for us. Wow. So questions? Mrs. Floor, I have one light. Otherwise, I can just go down the row. Have another one. Oh, I'm just going to start. Mrs. Snell, do you have any? I'm just going to go down this the row. This is here. great. This is great. And I, um, the, the program is great. And I'm sure the great teacher is, is helping. All your teachers, I'm sure, are helping. So um, I did have one question. So your classes um, are, the, the class size is okay. It, it looks like it's okay. It, it's okay now? It's not too big? Currently, I have a student teacher. Ah. So that mm. helps. 
Oh. And last semester, I had a student teacher, so that helped. But if I were to run the whole show, I have to be, I, I have to uh, do my small group differently. So instead of sitting with the kids, I may be up walking around the small mm -hmm. group while I, you know, tap mm -hmm. to make sure. And so it's a different kind of instruction. I could still do the curriculum. Uh huh. Uh huh. But it, but I would probably sacrifice the focus of going over the data with the kids as often mm -hmm. and um, doing uh, skills with that are intensely where I have right. to, you know, interact with them. So how many, I mean, I'm looking, so you must have um, 30 students? My, my largest class is towards the 30s. Towards the 30s. Last year when um, we did read the Read 180 program, we had the, my largest class was 17. And I could do the whole thing mm. myself oh, okay. because it's only five kids here. Five kids, I could see them here and five kids there or whatever, you know, so five or six. And so that was much more manageable. But mm -hmm. I actually requested student teachers <laughs> this year uh -huh. so I can have that extra adult in the classroom. Extra to, eyes yeah. on, on mm -hmm. what's going on. So um, the, okay, so high school, 66 students, three sections, and two teachers. That is true. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah, so the math comes out to be about 22 I know, per class, I, I right? Math as, as, as they kind of <laughs> come, come yeah. through. And um, yeah, so that's a brand new teacher. What we learned that's about and kind of those lessons teacher. learned is. Uh, no. Yeah, so we, we, we hired somebody who, when we were looking for language arts, who also had some Read 180 experience at their previous site, knowing that we wanted to kind of build capacity. And then really what I didn't cover in the lessons learned is during our late starts, we have, you know, kind of our PLC time, and really was, they were kind of grouped initially <coughs> with just being with language arts teachers in general. We, we found by about October, November, it was much more beneficial to really kind of separate out and have intentional conversations about these reading support with these teachers to really help to see what's working well, what do we need to change and drive differently to make sure that we built that collaboration model. So the high school with two teachers and three sections, those that class is about 20. Hmm. Yeah, okay. depends. Anywhere from 20, I think the greatest we have, I mean, I, obviously the average would be 22, but I think the greatest <laughs> is what, 24. And students. middle school is nine sections, <laughs> so that's like 20. It, it just depends on the conflicts so in, in the schedule. <laughs> yeah. Well, she, oh. so we have another middle school teacher that uh, that we brought on, and again, oh. as you heard, the overarching philosophy is you know plant your garden early so you can watch it grow, and so really being intentional um, about trying to okay. get, give some support to what we're seeing as uh, we have conversations with our feeder schools. So, right, what can we do to? Do you anticipate? To so you anticipate the program growing? You anticipate okay. needing to support more students? So just based off the of data we have, yeah. are there students that could be included in this that we currently aren't, especially at the high school level? Yes, yes. There, there would be okay. students that, that could be there. Okay, that's actually yeah. what my question was. My Mrs. two questions, my, I have two questions. So is there, is it, does READ 180 also apply for elementary students? Is there a way to start earlier to start doing this in third, fourth, fifth grade? So by the time they get to Mesa Middle, there's not as much to Sometimes catch up? Or is it only secondary? It is a stage B and a stage C, but that's all I've seen because I'm at middle school, high school, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, we well, there, is there an A, <laughs> right, A, B, C? Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't know if they have that same, the, the same program for elementary school, school students, but that if we could um, target those students earlier, then I yeah. then it would definitely... And, and I do know that our, our feeder schools, just like the STAR report gives us Lexile, right? So our feeder schools mm -hmm. are doing mm -hmm. tests that give them a Lexile score. Yeah. So rising up, we do kind of know, hey, here's the grade level band that the mm -hmm. student comes in with. And then we look at the other marks that they've been able to assess on. Yeah, because I'm just saying if we can do this in like third, fourth grade, that, you know, it, it's less pressure on the upper. And then my other well, question is. Well, before you go on, there... I, maybe I can help a little bit here. Oh, yeah. Um, Programs are designed for, at different grade levels for the different skills we need the students to learn. So you heard uh, uh, Yvonne mention that, you know, there's a phonics section. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's exactly why we have SIPs mm -hmm. in, in, in elementary, because it's got a strong phonics uh, base to it. So kids can walk out not walking away without their phonics. Phonics are very important. Phonemic awareness is very important to Well, my concern is level. more the kids that bypass that. So if they're in fourth and fifth grade, I mean, if you're getting kids who are juniors and they haven't learned basic phonics skills, and, you know, SIPS is, is 
foundational. And so if they get to fourth, fifth, sixth grade and they're at feeder schools, it would be beneficial if there's an A section to really start implementing that. I think that would make huge gains. And then my second comment um, is, is there any way or is this currently being offered in, in our summer programs? Because if, you know, if this is what we need. We need systemic direct literacy <coughs> instruction. So is this a part of what we're doing in the summer? Do you have a name? So, so we're, we're currently not run, running a summer literacy program. We're running summer math, but we're currently not running summer literacy. We have in the past, and looking at the data sets that came out, we weren't using the specific program, but we were measuring the growth, and it was pretty static. Mm -hmm. um, and we noticed that we were seeing a lot more growth with our math, so we're, mm -hmm. we focused a little more math. But doesn't mean that we couldn't consider this moving forward. Of hey, this seems in this. I mean, we're talking seven months of, of growth, but maybe, hey, if we did this for, you know, five, six weeks for this much time, yeah. you know, what would that look like potentially? I mean, I don't know, two and, 270 minutes might be too much for them. Yeah, I, I don't know. I was thinking about the amount of time because once it's so intense and there's, it's, they are doing something in every rotation that that's 90 minutes. If we said, well, you've got three more hours of this, I <laughs> don't know what would happen. Yeah, yeah. But I don't it think you would be as well. successful. Or even as an add-on, you know, if math is the focus, sure, just a little bit, a and, second, yeah, and then do another one. great, great thought. So, Miss mm -hmm. Anderson, just to answer your question, read one eighty is a fourth. It, it, it can go down to fourth grade. Okay. Um, again, though, I want to I want to be really uh, honest and say that a, a program isn't what um, uh, changes a kid's literacy ability. It's the teaching that goes on, and you heard last week or last time we were together. Um, Dr. Hogard, you know, has mm -hmm. several different interventions, kinder through, you know, her sixth grade to support, you know, kids continuing to grow um, in, in whatever areas they need. So there's lots of different programs out there that, that can be used, and it's really that idea of what uh, Dr. Haley talked about of diagnosing and prescribing the right medicine or supports for kids in their in their area of literacy. Yeah, I'm just one of the things that I'm trying to focus on and, and learn more about is consistency. I feel like we have so many different programs at so many different schools. And so particularly if there's schools that are feeder into Mesa, it, you know, mm -hmm. it could make more sense to use that than RTI or, you could know, I respond to just to a couple of other things uh, about the scholastic program. <laughs> Why? We're going down the line. We're Martha. going down the line. <laughs> well, OK, then I'll, I'll explain just it then. Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. It was a great presentation. Thank you. Well, I have time. I will. <laughs> Mrs. Barto. Okay. Um, I want to compliment you guys. This is really phenomenal. I'm really passionate about intervention for reading, so this is really great. Mm -hmm. um, I had a couple questions. There's a couple of little outliers where it looks like there's some below basic and they kind of stay at that level, and I know that that's kind of how it works for some kids. Do you guys have a plan for how do you deal with those students who um, – you put this, in, in, you know, this the effort into, and you see someone go from below basic to proficient, and then you um, have another student who can't seem to figure that out. Do you have a second tier for that? What's your, what's your plan? Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk from the a little more global and just kind of our other interventions that we have at our site, which is kind of that other side of that pyramid of looking at, you know, what's you know else is this student bringing to school that maybe is not uh, allowing them to be successful or interfering, right? And so we do, like a lot of times that is the case, right? Is there's just other things that are happening that is really creating that roadblock of, I, I can't move forward because right. all these other things. So it's really making sure we have robust abilities to have conversations to help support kids there so they can feel healthy to come to school so then we could kind of focus on the learning. A lot of it is attendance, like one of those outliers, I think the date they took the test was what, January or February, I think, on one of those, like, you didn't see any growth, but it was, they didn't test because they were, they were absent. So a lot of it is mm -hmm. attendance as well. Yeah. So from our view, like, those are the kind of the, hey, what students seem to be okay. struggling there? Then I'll let her talk to kind of what she's seeing instructionally about what can we do to move. Yeah. Um, when I notice that a kid is not growing, um, and we look at assessments, for example, like in our workshops, we have an interim checkpoint and an end of workshop checkpoint, and they always have an opportunity to retake the test, but that's not, that's not immediately, it's after instruction and looking at the data. And we still have, today for example, we had kids do a, a retake of a test that they, I said you have to have at least a 70 or above. Mm -hmm. They retook it and they had a 40, they had a 23. And these are, um, I'm like, if you have any questions, raise your hand and, and maybe you don't understand the question. And we've retaught the exact <coughs> skills that the, that the test is asking and they're still just like, you know. So mm -hmm. there are a handful of kids, even in the class that are not, um, utilizing the instruction and the resources yeah. and we we um have a, a couple kids that are um identified as tier two at our school that mm -hmm. are in the reading intervention classes so they're kids that 
are homeless and you know have they have uh, all these other issues going on and they're still in the reading in intervention class and they, they're tardy they're absent but we're doing what we can and we're trying to work with them but we we you know they're taking the test so yeah so well, this is great because then you can see too if there's an issue beyond what's you know apparent from the data that's yes. awesome Sure, and I'd say that to piggyback one other thing on that is like like I'm working with a student that I am passionate about seeing graduate, <laughs> and uh, so far we're uh, in second semester and zero credits, just basically a refusal to do work right. and digging into the why, and, and that's the that's the beauty of our jobs right. is, is yeah. to find that thing that's going to finally create that spark because he's smart right. and I just can't get him to turn. He can't yeah. commit. I mean, he's cordial, he's nice, but it's like when you find that connection and that's why mm -hmm. I'm such a huge proponent of, you know, of, of drama, of band, of, you know, right. all these extracurricular opportunities because if you find that connection and they feel included, mm -hmm. you see it switch and then all of a sudden they grow. Yeah. So yeah. it's not giving up, it's trying, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's just really just having those conversations as they, it's, it's got to happen. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately today I'm still not there, but I'm not going <laughs> to give up. They can, yeah. Keep on trying. Yeah, this is so great. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mrs. Yelsey. Yeah, this is fabulous, obviously. We, I mean, we so much appreciate this because we've seen in the past interventions and then we still have kids who are so far behind. Mm -hmm. And then we wonder what's going on because we've instilled these programs. So mm -hmm. I think it's great that Mrs. Marvin, there's someone like Mrs. Marvin who mm -hmm. keeps on it until they really reach all the kids. So my, it's more a district-wide thing. Do we have Ms. Marvin's <laughs> everywhere? Yeah. Times 30. No, other places, are you sharing what you're doing? Are we, are we going to be able to address these here by the school so far? Um, I'm just going to say that we had two days of training for READ 180 just this year at our district. And so there are uh, teachers and they, they have a, there's a READ 180, uh, you know, support person that comes into the classroom and, and, um, helps out with um, what are you still struggling struggling with but this is my second year and there's still things that I'm learning to do that I didn't do the first year but I feel like okay I see more growth because I'm doing this and then uh, because the program is so vast you can use the data there's like all kinds of data but it's how you use it so um, even though there are other programs out there and they might spit out the same kind of data, it's are you being intentional as a teacher to use that? So that's why one of the points on the lessons learned was that if we have dedicated reading teachers that aren't teaching another class, an English class, two other preps, then um, like what that's allowed me to do is really focus on um, just the reading class and, and spending the time um, looking at that data and figuring out how what I need to deliver even within the curriculum book that um, I could follow um, there's opportunities for me to break away from that to do what I need to do to um, catch students up so great and Miss Yelsey it is it is also read 180 is also at Estancia as well as Back Bay mm -hmm. and Newport Harbor is also considering great. yeah I'm thrilled we've been watching it um, you know over the years <laughs> and you know, like um, Miss Yelsey said that we're we're trying to figure out, you know, are we using our resources in the best way? So I so appreciate you being here and sharing that. I mean, it really is helpful um, for us because we want to make sure we're giving you all the support because this is our priority. So if you're down to one or two or three kids, you know, that are struggling, well, those are your new best friends and that you <laughs> will, <laughs> and they'll appreciate it when the light bulb, because, you know, I definitely seen that, that with your technical education as well. Oh, yeah. You know, when you combine that, you know, project-based learning and um, it's so great. So kudos to you all and we really appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Okay, you're up. Fabulous, fabulous. <laughs> I just want to um, address one question, uh, one comment um, in terms of, Ashley, your issue with the four through six, um, we had 180 several years ago and we, we researched it. The issue was that it's developed by Scholastic because they were finding the struggling readers, especially at the high, middle and high school, mm -hmm. there, was, there were no low readers, high interest books. That was the big issue is how do you get seven mm -hmm. through 12th graders in some respects reading when they have high interest, but they're, they're reading at, as Jake said, kindergarten, Second, third, or yeah. fourth grade level, and there was, there was nothing there for them. So that was part of the reason that w I think that we looked at the Read 180 was because of the ability to target high interest, 
but at their reading level. So kudos for you. Um, I do have a couple of questions. One is, this is an addition. So you have an eight period, which I thank you for having, continuing to have the block scheduling because it provides a wealth of opportunities for our kids. So are they, in addition to the intervention class, are they also placed in a, yes. a, a regular class? Regular language arts, yes. So they, they um, so this is, and they're placed, they're, they're not given a choice or do you have a conversation with the parents about that this is a suggested so, area? So counselors will have that conversation. So like, especially seventh and ninth grade will kind of focus on absolutely those conversations are happening because it's new at that level either at middle or high school and so we want to make sure we're supporting so if a student on their course selection sheet which we just finished you know put on there I want drama and you, you go through the reason why they're going to be minus one and which one would you not like to see on your mm -hmm. schedule well I want them all I'm like well which one would you not like to yeah. see because we're identifying some additional support so that conversation happens for sure and then we plug and play along with the other mesh courses that they're taking in PE. What's how do you um, communicate this need to the parents? How are you reaching out to to the parents? Because you know this is difficult for parents to accept also that they have a struggling reader. Um, sometimes they are also um, mm -hmm. English language learners mm -hmm. um, themselves. They haven't um, proceeded along, so there's not necessarily books in their homes. Yeah. There's not that. Yeah. I mean, we have the great computer, you know, one to one computers, and so the kids can. How are you communicating with the parents? I'll, I'll talk about the counseling and the administrative, then Yvonne can talk about maybe reports and discussions she has with the individual. Well, I'd, I'd say the majority, right? The majority of conversations that we have, you know, it's a, it's a thankful, wow, we're really happy that they get to be a part of this. You know, this is something that they've been struggling in, in for a while or they've been frustrated with school. So it's very rarely we get, you know, uh, really anger or, or like this is unfair. Very, very rarely do we get that. It's like, thank you. You know, we appreciate these extra supports because we too want to see them be successful. And we'll start with their mission. All students will graduate college and career ready. And so we want to get them to grade level by the time they're graduating so that they're reading at grade level so they can be successful in their career or a, as they continue on to college. So that's a passion. It's what we talk about. And very rarely do we get that, you know, other thing. And again, it's just this, the supports. And to kind of talk about best practices of instruction, so kind of, parallel to this was, you know, really hats off to some of uh, the grants that uh, Tina Taylor, who's one of our ELD teachers wrote, was really to go through and color code books in our library by Lexile that were at reading oh. level that weren't just call it a second grade book. My kids you know, used to love Curious George, right? Kid doesn't want to walk around with <laughs> that book when they're in ninth grade. So it was finding books that were Lexile appropriate outside right. of Read exactly. 180 that were also in our library that they could go and check out. And just by identifying that color, knowing, hey, look, this is appropriate for me. And then I'm going to grab it and then really starting to read more. And so our librarian will tell you, like, you start to look at that growth of just students checking out books mm. and the volume of books that are coming out versus what we saw before. So that intentional best practice. Is. So from ours, like I can honestly say, like I've never had a counselor call and say, "Hey, this discussion really went south regarding you know this." It's never happened in, in, in my time, and you can talk from. Um, I had, for example, a parent no, okay. last year whose daughter was switched into uh, Read 180 gorgeous. or Reading Intervention at the semester, and she's like, "What? What's going on? Why? Why did you move my daughter?" And I was like, "I didn't move her, I'll, mm. but we do." Uh, generate the reports and give them to the counselors and sometimes they will get moved into a reading intervention class but I explain like this even though your daughter has gotten A's in English um, based on these two assessments in the reading inventory she's at below basic and she's a seventh grader but if she can um, show growth by the end of the year she won't need intervention um, next year but you don't want her to be reading at a fifth grade level when she goes into eighth grade because that's going to just be more challenging mm -hmm. for her and she's like oh okay great and she <laughs> was fine, you know. And then I had, um, when students um, go from different levels, like uh, I had a student go from below basic to basic, and whenever they do that, I give certificates out, and it's just like, photo, you know, print, print certificates on my computer mm -hmm. and sign it. And I had uh, parents email and say, oh, Leo was so happy that he was so proud of his certificate. He never gets any certificates. Mm -hmm. And this was, like, not on fancy paper. Mm -hmm. It was on green photocopy paper and she was like I'm I'm really proud of him mm -hmm. and he's really he was so mm -hmm. happy to share that certificate with us at dinner the other night so I'm that's the kind of 
stuff that I'm hearing from most parents, I haven't had any parents like push against that, like take my kid out of that class. Mm -hmm. My kid doesn't need it. I've had parents say, my kid needs it, but she's in denial. She thinks she <laughs> could read, she thinks she could write, but, but keep her in the class. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm getting. <laughs> um, and I guess a, a couple of other questions is that, um, <clears throat> Is it mo you're not do you're you're doing single grade, so it's seventh a seventh grade intervention and eighth grade intervention, even though they are all over the place within within that that specific class. So there's not multi. You don't have a great, based yeah, on the schedule. Great question. So lesson lessons learned, and if you look back to the last slide, is you know we really don't see a, a, a need to differentiate. You know the who's teaching the class. We really mm -hmm. felt like hey, when appropriate. We can mix kids together. There are some seniors that are in the class that we've identified that could really benefit, you know, from being in this right now with their work ethic, where they are in the schooling, other information that we know about them. So it's important for us to give them that Good. support. Okay. Obviously, you know, like you, you look through, and I already told you that, hey, look, the earlier you start, the more rewards you're going to see. So really intentional in that kind of younger grade level targeting um, to make sure we can give those supports so they can continue to grow as they come through. Um, so really, but reflecting like hey what is the difference when I go into that when you saw that marquee classroom of the couch the color and then yeah. uh, that happens to be a special education classroom and then what I see when I walk through Yvonne's right it's it's parallel there's no differences in the instructional mm. delivery so it's opening our eyes for how we should approach this uh, from from all models of our educational philosophy of really you know when students are together you know they're all going to raise each other's levels have discussions so we don't need it to be in these separate pockets we can combine more together so that would be across grade levels too the high school could be a little more liberal with probably 9th through 11th and you know okay. every now and then other things so really in 7th 8th we do have some 8th graders mixed in with 7th okay. depending Great. on the schedule and then finally um, I'm really curious about the you know the be able to to service all the needs when you have class sizes ranging from 30 to, to 20 and and what you can do with one person versus two does any of this lend to a, a cohort of, of volunteers that that you know PTA or you know some you know the organization you know your your parent volunteer group could be trained so that they can be assisting if they're doing the choral reading I mean that type of thing is is does it lend itself could it lend itself to to a cohort of volunteers to be in the classroom to to sort of support support the support you in the program um, I think, I, like for me personally, I'd appreciate any other adult in the classroom <laughs> with me for every reading intervention right. class. But I think um, consistency is important because we do have a, um, a teacher, what's his title? Um, I don't know, but he, he um, will go into some read 180 classes, but he's not consistent every day, every period for this right. period. So then the teacher has to adjust, oh, well, this is third period, even though I did this with second period yesterday, I have to do it differently right, because consistent. that other adult isn't in the classroom. So yeah. I, um, I think for me, it's better when I have that consistent for, right. in my case, student teacher there because she knows the program, she knows what we're working on, she knows how to support the kids even though they're doing, she's mostly monitoring or when she's teaching, she's teaching and I'm monitoring, but um, um, I think that would be more ideal than just having a parent come in one day right. and then I, I would take Vanessa. Them. Where's <laughs> Vanessa? Where's the Where's the Gailey Foundation? Oh, <laughs> we need and it. And I really think trying to set a ceiling at 21 is the is the right number. So Good. you have rotations okay. of seven. But that's a great experience exactly. for the student teacher. I mean, oh, yeah. boy, that you know, we, we were fortunate there, enough. Yeah. Yvonne had one in the fall. We were mm -hmm. uh, fortunate enough to uh, have some capacity where we hired her in the spring, I and mean, she's outstanding. Oh, that's so, great. So, yeah. that's great. Good. Awesome. Thank you, Jake. Um, I want to thank you on behalf of all of us here. Yeah. This was an eye-opening report with real data, not contrived data, <laughs> not data that made us look great. It's data that was real. We can see the successes and then be very proud of those successes because we know how hard you worked to get that to That's happen. Great. And to see, we've been saying this, and you probably have been saying this way before I got on the board. <laughs> we saw, we, you showed us, and, and we're struggling with this, and we still have these children that are, that are resistant to learning, not unable, but resistant, and we just have to figure out what the hook is, and <laughs> or you do. We yeah, I, I, I almost want to give him a shout out right now and say, "Hey, if you're watching, look, look you're on TV. Here you are. Here's your um, principal." I want to thank you so much because because 
we know we know that we're working hard, and this shows that we are getting results, mm -hmm. albeit not the panacea that we would love to have, and say, fine, let's just do this, and all children will be reading at grade level at the end of the year. But it's a struggle, and our interventions, while we've been doing them all along, are getting more and more deliberate and focused at every one of our elementary sites. So my hope, and I'm <laughs> confident, that you'll be getting your incoming seventh graders more and more prepared from the feeder schools so that mm -hmm. I don't want you to never have job security, but so <laughs> that we don't need five of you at every school, maybe just you. But, so. but think about the forecast moving forward of, right, we're at 50% proficiency now with our juniors, right? Let's wait two years with targeted ninth grade. How great will 82% look on that? Right. You know, uh, exactly. That, right? Or, you know, it's pretty awesome. It's, so It's pretty Hopefully, phenomenal. You know, you got to work towards it. Pretty and good. I want to thank you on the whole educate. Oops. Do you have a, yes. Just real quick, in regards to the elementary level, a couple pieces. Um, uh, Read 180 has a one of the three pillars that you saw up there mm -hmm. is its independent reading portion, and that is called reading counts. Mm -hmm. Martha, in your reference previously, um, that is an independent reading program at the elementary level in all of our schools. We our independent reading program is accelerated reader, reader. and there are. All of our libraries are leveled based on the Accelerated Reader Program. Our library circulation program, which is Destiny, incorporates Accelerated Reader. So that's mm -hmm. one of the pieces that we worked through when we had Read 180 previously. And the other thing is, when we talk about the elementary level, we've done a lot of work with the Wonders program. Mm -hmm. And WonderWorks is a component of the comprehensive Wonders English Language Arts program. So a lot of work has been done in regards to WonderWorks and then also um, SIPS and SIPS Plus are two additional components. So just in regards yeah. to uh, things at the elementary level, I think that's an important piece because we wouldn't want to be operating two independent reading programs, especially when our libraries are structured in a particular way that supports the accelerated reader program. But that's not a conflict at all at the secondary level. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, education team. Thank you for this piece. This was a great follow-up on what we got from elementary. So thank you. Thank you. Guys. Get, get three hours of sleep and then go back to work. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Community input, Mrs. Black. Oh. Okay. Um. This is an opportunity for the public to address the board on action items, consent calendar, resolution consent calendars, and discussion action calendar. Per our board policy 9323, each individual speaker will have three minutes. Speakers may not cede unused minutes to other speakers, and there is a maximum of 20 minutes of uh, comments per item. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments. Depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to speak, the board staff or members of the public may request that a specific item on the consent be moved to discussion action. Requests to move consent items must be received prior to the time the board takes action on the consent calendar. Um, all comments are recorded in full on meeting video record. When addressing the board, it is helpful if you state your name and address for the record. Thank you. We have three um, con three opportunities for comment. Um, Lynn Riddle. <laughs> Good afternoon, or good evening, excuse me, <laughs> ladies and members of the board. Uh, my name is Lynn Riddle. I am a resident of Newport Beach. I will tell you, because it's important to what I'm going to say, that I'm a retired federal judge. I served 14 years here in the Ronald Reagan Federal Building in the United States Courthouse. I mention that because I want to comment on your resolution, uh, 17, it's your item 17D, Resolution 220419, and that relates to a, a <laughs> law, and that's why I mention my background. So your resolution is to support reform of the California Charter Schools Act, and 
for those in the audience that may not know what this, this is about, at least this is the bottom line of your resolution, that you would support current legislative efforts to reform the California Charter Schools Act so that the law recognizes and ensures that local elected school boards are the sole authority for approval and oversight over charter schools op uh, operating within their districts. So that's your proposal. Now, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was at the meeting of the Orange County Board of Education. And for those who don't know, in the event that a local school board denies a petition to establish a charter school within your district, those petitioners have a right to appeal presently under the present law that denial to the County Board of Education. And so I return back to what I was going to say about two weeks ago. On April the 10th, I was at the Orange County Board of Education meeting, and on their agenda was a resolution where they, where they opposed the um, uh, amendments to the Charter School Reform Act. And in their resolution, among the things that they said was that the Charter School Reform Act, if passed, would severely limit appeals for newly chartered petitions, thereby denying a critical safeguard for local communities, families, and teachers to appeal to a neutral party <laughs> an often political decision by a local district to deny high quality schools. And whereas denying the right to appeal to a local charter decision to a higher authority, and that would undermine democratic justice and due process. Well, that's a difference of opinion, is it not? Mm -hmm. And I wondered who was right, and I sort of looked for evidence Oops. Oops, sorry. <laughs> I'm very sorry. Is my time up? Um, yes. Does the board have any question for any concerns if I extend no, Judge Riddle? I would like to hear, hear the rest of Yeah. I'm Thank so you. sorry. I tend to be long winded, but I <laughs> wanted to set the back. I'll try to make this as quickly as possible. My research included this. I looked through the or Orange County De Board of Education's rulings over the last four years with respect to charter petition denials and found that there were 12 and they reversed all 12. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering then what might be behind that. And I recalled too that on March the 6th, the Orange County Board of Education reversed your denial of, an, of a, charter, um, a charter denial. And I was wondering what might be behind that. I'm not sure that this is exactly the answer, but I will tell you some evidence that I found. Your denial was denied, or excuse me, your denial was overruled by a vote of three to two. Among those three votes, two of the members that voted had just been elected in June of 2018 and during their election, and you will all appreciate that, jointly those two members received and spent 800, more than $800,000 in their running for their seats. Ordinarily, people spend about $25,000 to run for board seats. $425,000 of that came directly from California Charter School Association PACs. That's more than 50% of their donations came from one donor. The third vote came from a, from a trustee that was elected in 2016, where 63% of his donations came from the California Charter Schools Association. I don't know the answer to that, but when I read a neutral party that was mm -hmm. more just mm -hmm. and non-political. I uh, had my own sense of reservation. I thank you for that. I wish you well, and I, I applaud you. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to. I just want to say the exception that we made to extend her time. It's not often you have a retired federal judge yes. come in to get. <laughs> so um, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. That it was impressive for me too. Yeah. Um, Lori Smith. There you are. I didn't see you. <laughs> OK. 
Good evening. Um, I am here also to express my strong support for Resolution 220419, Agenda Item 17D. And I'm here, I wrote the board this afternoon, but I'm here, so I'm here really to speak to the public who's here, um, our hardworking staff that can't always follow these issues. I know I didn't when I was a teacher. Um, I just couldn't keep up with what was happening up here and in the public sector. This is a crucial time for public schools. And this resolution is really a valuable thing that you did here um, and the public needs to know. It appears to support AB 1505 and AB 1507. I encourage the board to also support, um, when you get a chance, <laughs> 1506, which is the charter school cap. They, these are, um, I've read all three reform bills and they are very important. They're well written, considerate of local control of public um, school governance and dollars, will protect our school district and others from poor quality untried charter schools, such as the one the Orange County of Bo Board of Education just thrust on us despite Ural's denial and careful research and review. Um, and in addition to doing that, though, they have preserved the ability of high quality charters to exist. Um, what's noteworthy is that Ocean View School District just wrote a resolution and letter to the bill's sponsor that indicated um, they had joined in their opinion with the Orange County Department of Education superintendent. Mm. I feel this is a powerful display, display of local unity. I hope Newport Mesa's community um, uses its united voices as well to oppose our current pro-charter school county board, which Judge um, Riddle just mentioned, is ser of serious concern, the pro-charter school majority, that is aggressively, irresponsibly, and I feel truly negligently approving charter schools in our county and doing so with blatant disregard of the public support for local control. I was there as, as several of you, many of you in the room were of course, at these Orange County Board education meetings and I was absolutely mm -hmm. shocked at the disregard for the public's will um, and for facts. It, it was, it, it was <coughs> unbelievable. Um, we need to do something about it, we need to vote, we need to use our voices and we need to prevent this from happening. Thank you to the board um, for this crucial, ref the, uh, this crucial resolution for continuing to support charter school reform legislation now. And to the audience, I hope in advance, I'm saying thank you for you getting out there and using your voices. And you can go to action. Um, network.org and just put in charter, charter schools, it'll come right up and you can write a letter. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Dowdy. And while he's coming up, there were three for Franny Field. I'm going to save that till we vote on that part. So the comments that you're going to make, I'm saving it for more impact when unless we, they, unless when they we vote. Need to. Unless you need to leave for some reason, Do, does any... Okay, good, thanks. <laughs> Sorry. So good evening, President Matoye, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, members of the cabinet and the public. I'm Britt Dowdy. I am the president of the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers. And I am also speaking in favor of the resolution which uh, the previous two speakers have mentioned for very similar reasons. And um, uh, NMFT believes that local control is the best policy to have quality charter schools. And so if there are going to be charter schools, we believe that this board needs to be the governing body to provide the correct oversight for curriculum and fiscal oversight and the other associated pieces. And it is extremely unfortunate uh, that the three members of the Orange County Board of Education voted <coughs> in opposition to the hard work of the staff here. Uh, your will, uh, which was representative of the community, which was opposed to that charter school. Uh, so uh, as uh, the speakers previously mentioned, uh, we want to make sure that the public is aware that there are um, a set of assembly bills going through the legislature, specifically 1505 and assembly bill 1507 are directly related to uh, the resolution that you are speaking to. And then 1506 is related, but it's more about a statewide uh, cap and then placing caps 
uh, for how they are approved locally. Um, so we are wanting to make sure that the members of the public are aware of those three bill numbers, that they are able to ask their assembly members to support them, and then once, if it's approved, then ask their senators to approve it once it moves to that chamber as well. Uh, we're confident that the governor would sign all three bills. Um, I also want to make uh, you, as well as our other interested education parties in the room and members of the community aware that May 22nd is going to be a statewide day of action in Sacramento related to this suite of, of bills. And we encourage all members of the community who are advocates of, ch of charter school reform to go to Sacramento May 22nd. Uh, and join with uh, just a public uh, demonstration of support for sensible reform so that we can continue to have high quality public schools, whether they are traditional K-12s or they are charter <laughs> schools. We just wanna make sure that everything that we have with public expenditures are effectively managed for our kids. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Superintendent's report. Uh, yes, um, appreciate the uh, testimony that we've heard today in uh, open in uh, comment, public comment about the the need to rebalance the system. It's completely out of balance, uh, and there is no local control. I also want to go back to the uh, secondary intervention presentation. Sitting here remembering that it's probably 17, maybe 18 years ago, that I first started working with teachers in Read 180. Yeah, exactly. And I can tell you that there isn't a software out there that is teacher proof. There is no such thing as software that works without a teacher. Yep. I can also tell you that a teacher makes a big difference with that mm -hmm. software. Oh, and you got to see a very talented English teacher tonight, Yvonne, and I've been in her classroom probably over the three, four years out uh, as a Costa Mesa, probably, you know, 150 times. I'm, I'm sure I left her as many notes about, you know, the things that I saw that were really good in there and, you know, it might challenge her to think otherwise in, in, in other ways, but uh, she makes a difference. There's a, there's a skilled teacher who utilizes the tools effectively. Mm -hmm. um, and she could probably do that with any program. Mm -hmm. She could probably do that not as easily without a program. <laughs> but uh, so, you know, I just want you, I just want to make sure that everybody understands the teacher makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. There is no software that's teacher proof. There is no book that's teacher proof. And our teachers are the magicians who make it all happen. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, all right, we're at the consent calendar. Do I have a motion to approve <coughs> the consent calendar? Move approval as presented. Mrs. Flora, second. 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 Mrs. Black, do we have any discussion? Okay, I'll call the question. <laughs> All those in favor of approving the consent calendar, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Wow, that was exciting. Thank you. Resolution time. Um, all of our resolutions are going to be a roll call vote for the public so that you know that. Um, Mrs. Jockham, would you read 17A, please? Sorry. It's it says to call, tell, call you for 17A. Do you want me to read it? The resolution. The resolution. Yeah, I, she's I not going to read it. She's going to give you some background on it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. okay. I'm like, uh, Oh, no, no, not read the wherefore <laughs> to us. That's oh, I, I, oh, I could no. do that too, but um, I don't have it in front of me. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, you know, we um, you. are very fortunate in Newport Mesa that our, our board has... Um, sees the benefit of school nurses and uh, that that we know that um, even in the presentation we were talking about some of those factors why kids don't improve and why they're not making progress um, can be related to health social emotional all of those issues so we are just really um, thankful that that we have nurses that we are you know the only district around that has a uh, has a clinic and on district property clinic to serve our families. Um, so we just want to put this resolution forward just to acknowledge the work that they do on a daily basis. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Floor? Um, yes. Um, typically we adopt these in one, one motion, but I think that uh, several of these are so very, very important, um, it, especially the nurses. Uh, especially recognizing the day of the teacher yeah. and and the third one and the last one um, teacher appreciation but also the 
the that's charter we're, school. That's why we're doing them separately. Yeah. Well, yeah. I didn't know that you were doing that because it's all one consent calendar. So, so you do are we taking them one at a time? Are you calling for a motion for I'm, one of them? I'm calling for a motion. Yeah. For a motion to do them one at a time. Okay. <laughs> So move approval of adoption of resolution 190419 observing May 8, 2019 as National School uh, School Nurse Day and the week of May 6 through May 10th, 2019 as National School Nurse Week. Second. I second. <laughs> you, you got, you got, I'll give Mrs. Bartow. You got six seconds. <laughs> okay, Mrs. Floor moved, Mrs. Bartow seconded. Roll call vote. Ms. Matoy? Yes. Ms. Floor? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Yes. Ms. Bartow? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Snow? All righty. Um, 17 B. Yes. Ms. Snell? <laughs> Ma, I'm sorry. Snell. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear my name. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Now, now we can move on to Ms. Olson. Thank you very much. Well, likewise, that is a very mm -hmm. special week for us because mm -hmm. with um, our teachers, of which we have over 1,200 teachers within our certificated staff that serve our students, and you heard um, tonight the talent that goes behind creating the success stories of our students, of supporting them each and every day as they come in. And we do know that it only takes one significant adult to make a difference in a child's life. And teachers spend the majority of the day with our children. And so they are so truly special and talented. And in Newport Mesa, we have an exceptional staff. So we tonight, we are bringing forward also a resolution to recommend that the Board um, of Education adopt to observe the day of the teacher, May 8th, as well as the week of the teacher, which is the national recognition, May 6th through the 10th. Excellent. Okay, um, I'd like to move uh, to adopt resolution number 20-04-19, recognizing California Day of the Teacher, May 8th, 2019, and National Teacher Appreciation Week, May 6th through 10, 2019. Second. Second. <laughs> <laughs> it was moved by Mrs. Snell and seconded by Ms. Anderson. All those, a roll call vote. Ms. Matoy? Yes. Ms. Fleur? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Yes. Ms. Bartow? Yes. Ms. Anderson? <laughs> yes. Ms. Snow? Yes. <laughs> okay. Mr. Trader, would you speak to Resolution 17C? It's actually... Or Ms. I, Doc, I, Mr. I'll, Holcomb. I'll speak to it, yes. <laughs> okay. Or, or Mr. Trader. So much for it, looking at my notes. It's not nearly as exciting as these other three. Mm -hmm. It is simply a resolution that the state of California has asked us to pass in order to uh, file applications for school facility funding uh, in light of the fact that the state has already committed all of the money <laughs> that it currently has. <laughs> so this is an acknowledgement that we're just getting in line with the hope that there will be a future bond. It's going to get us money. That's a good that's, thing. That's Don't we do thing. this every year? No, not this particular. Oh, okay. No. It seems like we're getting in line every year. <laughs> yeah. well, money, we do always get in line. Promised, this is and, just one of the times okay. when the state doesn't have any money. Okay. And we have to acknowledge that. Okay. Do I hear a motion? So move. Oh. Second. Did you want to do it? No. No, I second. You want me to read it? Ladies do it. Well, I second. She said it. I you hear me. I, I seconded. Thank okay. you. Thank you. I didn't get that. Mrs. Black moved and Mrs. Bartow seconded. Roll call vote. Ms. Matoye? Yes. Ms. Fleur? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Yes. Ms. Bartow? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Snow? Yes. Can I move? No. Somebody else make a motion for uh, 17D and support to reform the uh, Ms. I, Ms. Bartow should do it. I think so. You're mm -hmm. our lunch person. All right. I'd like to make a motion to adopt resolution 2204119 in support of reform to the California Charter Schools Act. Second. Second. Okay. It was Second. moved by <laughs> Mrs. Bartow and seconded by Mrs. Yelsey. Roll call. Uh, Ms. I have Oops. my light on there. I am so sorry. Thank you. Comment? Uh, yes, um, I want to thank um, the individuals that spoke already and in support of in support of of this resolution. I can categorically um, state that this board and previous boards are not opposed to charter schools. We all support high quality charter schools that are homegrown, 
within our district that come from our communities. And we have had on a couple of occasions individuals who have brought forth um, proposals for charter schools in this district. And as a result, we have worked with them. And you can see some of that fruition from the, with the dual immersion programs, the, the magnet school, as well as um, the modern scholars program. So we are not opposed to it. What we are opposed is uh, poorly written, poorly crafted, and outsiders coming into our district thinking that they know best of how to educate our students, um, which is totally incorrect. I can also categorically say that um, by and large, this board is transparent and seeks input and values input from our community. Whereas if you go to the Orange County Department of Ed board meetings, A, they're, they're done at 10 o'clock in the morning, and they have limited time for public um, comment. Their comment is generally after, for example, this last one, their, their comments were not proposed, and you could only speak at 12 o'clock noon when the meeting started at 10. And so after a lot of conversation, they, they generously allowed uh, comment on those two proposals. Um, this is similar to what how the Orange County supervisors, um, the county supervisors are operating and are being sued by the ACLU because they are trying to shut down uh, community input. Um, again, we are not opposed to charters. This charter was actually recommended for denial by their own county staff. Um, so their county, their highly qualified county staff um, at, requested that this be denied the because they had a concern <laughs> that they could not fulfill their obligations. Um, but uh, we were overruled, and now it will be a wait-and-see game to see whether they're successful or not. Uh, it will be a county charter, but it will be in our district. So again, um, move adoption, of, uh, that's sure. done. I, I, I am absolutely appalled at... Uh, the county board's opportunity and thank mm -hmm. you Ms. Rydell and thank you Lori for calling upon all of our citizens within within Newport Mesa um, please educate yourselves on the upcoming elections in 2020 um, and beyond because this is unconscionable Mrs. Bartow did you have anything else to add because I know you did extensive extensive research we got an amazing report so well, I'm going to give my ledge report later, but okay. I will talk about this specifically. Um, our resolution is not addressing a specific bill, but more of a support for reform in general. Um, but we are referring to AB 1505, AB 1507, and then again, AB 1506 is in the general reform that we're supporting. Thank you. Um, roll call. Ms. Matoye? Yes. Ms. Fleur? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Yes. Ms. Bartow? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Snow? Absolutely yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, that okay. was wonderful. <coughs> Discussion action calendar. We have three comments to be made. Um, Mr. D'Alessandro. Good evening, um, Dr. Navarro, President Montoya, board members. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, my name is Mike D'Alessandra. I live on Cibola Avenue in Costa Mesa. I'm here tonight to thank you for your consideration and support for our proposal to rename Davis Field 1 Franey Field at Davis Magnet School. Um, on December 6th of 2018, we suddenly lost our very good friend, Keith Franey. Keith was a beloved member of our Davis Magnet School family. He was a very influential member in the Newport Mesa community. Um, Keith served with distinction on our Education Foundation board, also with uh, Region 97 um, soccer. <laughs> he was probably more closely associated with Pilot Cup. That was his passion. And for years, he served as an organizer and a coach with Pilot Cup, you know, spreading the love of soccer to thousands of kids throughout the district. Um, here with me tonight is, uh, is Keith's wife, Mary. 
she's in the audience. Oh. Uh, Keith's father, Jan Franey, other family members and friends here to show their support. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of the community feedback. Um, again, we, uh, we urge you and hope to vote to approve Franey Field mm -hmm. tonight as we want to roll it out in this year's Pilot Cup. And um, we, we do that and we want to um, have Keith's legacy uh, live on forever on the soccer field uh, with Pilot Cup for years to come. So I thank you for your support. Thank you very Thanks. much. Mm -hmm. Jan Frank. <laughs> Jan Frank, did Jan leave? Yep, oh, there you are. Where's Mr. Fra oh, Mr. Franey, I'm sorry, I read your name wrong, how rude. <laughs> Mr. Franey. <laughs> Madam President, fellow board members, my name is Jan Franey. I live in the city of Mission Viejo. My son has been in this community of Newport Mesa for many years, and he was a dedicated father, and I'm here on behalf of myself and Mary and our family and friends to thank you all for considering naming this field. Um, Keith loved his family and he loved the community. He coached women, girls, men, boys. He played in a men's soccer league and that was his really love, soccer. Um, again, we appreciate you taking the consideration to name this field. Thank you. Thank you very much. Brett Woods. Brett Woods, Brett, <laughs> Wood, you, <laughs> Mr. Woods. <laughs> um, trustees, uh, as Mr. Franey just said, uh, thanks for your consideration on this. I can tell you that uh, Keith uh, was a friend of mine, so I'm biased, um, but I can tell you that Keith was a good friend of mine, and when I say a good friend, he's a good guy. Um, I would go into how he made me a better person, but it's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> but uh, honestly, Keith, uh, we need more like him. He touched a lot of lives. I think they figured out he coached about 300 kids um, in the Newport Mesa area. And uh, not just in youth sports, but if we had volunteers in every area of the community like Keith, I'm telling you the community would be a lot better place and so even me being biased, I can try and look at this from the outside and, and realize that naming this field sets a very good example for the community and something for community members to strive for. So thanks again for your Thank consideration. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Brett Eccles. Mr. Eccles. Good morning, um, Madam President and trustees. Uh, Brett Eccles, resident of Costa Mesa and uh, former AYSO 97 commissioner and uh, former parks commissioner in the city of Costa Mesa and um, a couple other things. But those are the two I want to focus in on tonight because uh, Keith, as, as Mr. Woods just said, uh, is a great friend of mine and I miss him very much, but I can't think of a greater honor uh, to bestow on someone who gave so much to our community through volunteerism and giving, educating our children um, is a special, special person. And when this came about, I was so excited and uh, just makes me happy to see that we can honor hopefully someone with your vote tonight. Uh, that uh, again, servant leadership, role modeling, educating, and that's what you're all here for is education. And he did it on the sports fields. He joined our board a number of years ago, reluctantly as many of us do, I had to kind of grab him and say, come on. But once he was in, he was all in and he was on our board. He served uh, as a coach, a referee, a board member, has previously spoken. His, his legacy was that pilot cup too. He was a fantastic coach. Uh, we, we, we went head to head together too on many of the games. So it's a great competitor, a great friend. And um, as, as Mr. Woods said, I can't think of a better thing to uh, honor someone where we need more. 
We need more of that in our community. So I would urge you to vote to approve and I thank you for your time. Um, Madam President, I know that um, we generally don't bestow upon our, pre our president doesn't get to make motions very often because they're supposed to be the facilitators. But in this case, I would ask that we allow our board president to make this motion. Thank you. I move that we approve the naming of Davis Field one, the Franey Field. Do second. I hear a second? Second. Mrs. Floor seconded. Can I make a oh, Mrs. Yelsey. Oops, Mrs. Yelsey. Oh. Yeah. Was she? Um, I didn't know Mr. Franey, but I wish I had because I've talked to so many people. And someone just sent this to me and I just wanted to read it on their behalf. Um, hi, Karen, I know, I hope I'm not overstepping here, but I just heard that my son's soccer practice is canceled tonight because today is the day that the school board is considering naming the Davis soccer field Keith Franey. Keith's son plays on our team and I filled out the survey last my, night, last month. I wish I could be there to support this idea as someone from the other side of the bay. Unfortunately, she wouldn't be able to be here. I know, I know you've probably never interacted with him, but he was a very special guy, and, and I had the privilege of attending his memorial service, which was truly like nothing I had ever seen. A true celebration of life for a gentleman who made a big difference in people's lives with many hearts. And that was from Bridget C. and Franny. Oh, thank you. From Newport Beach. Mrs. Dr. Gogol, do you happen to have the results from the survey with you? I'm, before we voted, I'm just curious. Or if you could well, it was in our wing report. it. Was it in our report? Yeah, it was 477 or something. 400, I mean. 500. 477 results in support and 25 not in Thank support. You. That is such an overwhelming number. And I wanted to get that into the record so that the public understands that we just don't mm -hmm. say, oh, let's name a field this or name a field that. It has to take overwhelming public support. And it got it, in my opinion. So with that, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any Aye. opposed? Aye. Any abstain? 7-0. Congratulations. Aye. We now have so I shouldn't have done that. <laughs> I want to thank you, and I also want to thank Principal Flores for being here tonight and supporting the community in going along with this because it's her school that's getting a field named, <laughs> and and that's one of the pieces is to make sure that that's great. And I'm, I'm excited that we could get it done in time so Daily Pilot Cup can be a ribbon cutting of some sort. So. Thank you very, very much. Yes, invite us to the ribbon cutting. Please invite <laughs> us to the ribbon cutting. And uh, just so that you know, you don't have to stay for the rest of it if you don't want. Thank you for, <laughs> thank you for sticking it out till 8 o'clock. We will not be upset if you take off. So thank you so much for doing this for him. Okay. 18, 18B on our discussion action. Mr. Lee Sung. <laughs> Mm -hmm. oh, something in the air. <laughs> we are bringing back for your consideration the uh, board meeting dates uh, for the period between uh, July 1st of 2019 all the way to June 30th, uh, 2020. Uh, if you recall, several um, months ago, we had uh, a very spirited uh, discussion about board meeting dates, and mm -hmm. the board decided to only approve board meeting dates up until uh, June 30th, up to this school year, primarily because the concern of changing a pattern that has been established and making sure that word got out and that uh, <clears throat> people could plan appropriately. So I think that was a very appropriate decision. Uh, but uh, President Matoye had asked us to put together dates for a full 12-month period rather than just a six-month period till the end of December to actually align with uh, a school year. So we felt that was a very practical suggestion. So you're, for your consideration, we have dates uh, for a full 12-month period. You'll also see on the, uh, <clears throat> the dates that are presented specifically by date as well as represented on a calendar. 
uh, that you'll see a pattern of approximately three weeks between each board meeting. There are some exceptions to fit in three set study sessions uh, that the board has requested. Uh, certainly we can always add additional study sessions, but at least we know there are three set uh, in the calendar. Uh, you'll also notice that there's a couple of dates where rather than on a Tuesday night, uh, there's a Monday on October 7th, and that is out of respect for a Jewish uh, holiday as well as a Wednesday in March. So both of those are in consideration of, of Jewish holidays. And then in June, we have two meetings to comply with uh, the requirements to have both LCAP and budget in a public hearing and then um, <coughs> approved by the end of the, uh, uh, the month of June or before the end of the month of June. So uh, that's the dates for your consideration. I also want to point out that the July meeting is later than usual, uh, and that is because it comes up, we've always planned too close to July the 4th, and it's hard for us to, really, for us to prep with uh, the school close, the district close for a few days. You don't need a vacation. No, I understand well, that. Yeah, I understand we that. don't really yeah. need a vacation, yeah. right? We are stoic. We can't. Yeah, that's okay. We can do it. But we thought, you know, the 16th <laughs> would give you enough time between that and the August 27th meeting for a break. If that's your, if that's your, if you agree to that. And since I don't get the privilege twice, do I have a motion to? We have to have a, a motion to approve and second before I move, we can discuss. I so, move to approve okay. the proposed board meeting dates for July 2019 through June 2020. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay, it's been approved by Mrs. Snell, second by Mrs. Black. Discussion. Mrs. Snell, you had your... Uh, um, I just want to... I went over the, <laughs> um, the calendar. I think it's great. Um, I like that we're doing it um, for the entire school year. It makes planning so much easier for everyone. And, um, and uh, so I'm, I think this is great. I wanted to vote for this before. <laughs> so I'm glad we waited and we're prudent. And now I still like it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm just going to go down the yeah, line I again. Miss Anderson, a good idea. do you have any comments? I don't. I think that this is great that we are meeting less. I hope that our meetings will be filled with reports and very robust, but I think it makes sense from the studies that we've done countywide, and I think to respect the public that to have a lot of these are one meeting a month, I think is more in line with, I think, <coughs> what people want. So I think it's a great idea. And the dates are lovely. I like having it all planned out for a very long time. <laughs> with the study sessions, I'm very excited about yes. having study sessions. Mrs. Bartow, and I apologize about your vacation. Mrs. Bartow. Um, I love, the dates are great. I just, was the July 16th the date that worked the best after review? Okay. Hmm. Yeah, we could bump it back Mrs. another Tuesday. Yeah, I, it's fine. It was a personal concern, but I wonder if we could move it to the 23rd if that worked, but if not, that's fine. We, could, we can come back to you with that proviso. You'll be out of town. Then. You'll be out of You'll town? Be out of town. So, be out of town all would you like us, no, well, I, I, so would you like us to move it a week earlier? No, a week back. A, a week oh, back, the 23rd. Wait, what? But oh, no, it would either, it'd have to go to the 9th. <laughs> Which is two board members already told Which me this. Which is for the night. Way too. Yeah. Um, or can we move it to the 15th? Can we move it to the 15th? Uh, do it on Monday? If it messes everyone up, it's fine. Let, well, hold on. Okay. Uh, we can, we can, we can, if you approve it with that proviso, we can come back and confirm, okay? Okay. We just have to look at all of the calendars, but mm -hmm. we can look at it. S Mrs. Snell, could you amend your motion to look at whether Monday or Tuesday would be okay? Yes, I could do that. Um, I <laughs> only because the plans I, I, I I'm I have a problem with changing okay. a meeting because someone has oh. vacation plans. Okay. I mean, it's okay this is what works, mm -hmm. and you could certainly miss a meet one meeting um, right. because. But anyway, that's just my it personal. Is fine. It's not. Okay. It's more just, it, you know, how flexible can well, I if be? If we don't have a quorum, because I'm not going to be here either, and I know on the f you won't be here on the 16th uh, either. Uh, on the 17th. Oh, oh, on this oh is the I thought it was on the 16th. It's on the 16th. On the 16th. On the 16th. Yeah, Will you be here I'm on the? Yeah. Okay. Um, be here for that. I I would be happy to amend my motion for further. Um, 
discussion on the July date. Okay. How's that? Okay, good. And Mrs. Black, are you okay seconding that? Yes. Okay. Um, we are to Mrs. Yelsey. Or did you have any other comments? Mrs. No. No, that okay. was it. Everything looks great. I like it. I'm good. Mrs. Black? Yeah, I'm good. Mrs. Floor. Uh, yeah, uh, I am. Um, I'm, okay, I'm okay with this. However, I want to make note that uh, between in the January, it's 12 meetings, um, and there was a complaint last year that we had too many meetings, and there are actually 12 meetings, um, or actually 11. Um, I do have one request that I would like to propose on this: um, is that currently we meet at three o'clock in the afternoon um, and start with closed session. And then we go on. Um, and because we are limiting now to one meeting a month, I suspect that they will be jam-packed. So I, am, um, I would like to propose that during the agenda prep period, that if, if the three board members see that, that that meeting is really packed, that we consider uh, having a separate meeting for closed items. Um, because they tend to get away from us, oh. so that if we could, if we could consider having sep a separate closed session occasionally, so that Every it does allow time. for the board meetings to be robust, um, lots of conversation and um, focusing on what we're and supposed to be hours. doing, and not <laughs> dealing with uh, feeling a feeling rushed that we have to limit our reports. <laughs> and our conversation to a 15 minute um, and that uh, we still are going to be getting out of here at a reasonable time versus 10 or 11 o'clock that we take a look and allow for that to occur um, maybe on occasion because I just I'm sorry but if we're going to be if we have to do this once a month then those those items um, and those close session conversations may be long um, the other issue, of course, that I've uh, I discussed and what concerns me, and I just want to make sure that we are clear on the impact that this will have on our sites as it relates to all of those requests, for example, field trips, uh, requests, uh, outdoor education, all of those that we routinely see every two weeks um, now will be limited to uh, once a month, and I just want to make sure that that is sort of settled with our principals and our teachers in terms of those requests, um, and also textbook adoptions, uh, because right now the textbook adoption is on a 30-day, 30, 30 and so this is going to be requiring to take some look, look at that. I'm absolutely okay with this, but I just want to make sure that we minimize the impact um, in terms of scheduling for our teachers and our and our school sites, PTAs, there's going to be some adjustments on that, um, okay. as well as um, some of the other things in terms of uh, the community being able to be noticed and and that communication. Speaking to your two points, the second one you self-explanatory and you spoke to the people who needed it. On the first one, if the board members that are doing closed session. Rephrase agenda, agenda prep. prep. Agenda prep. The board members that are doing agenda prep determine that a closed or sometimes circumstances beyond our control, i.e., charter schools, <coughs> might require that. And that would be a special meeting that would be caused to call to handle that. But it doesn't. It won't affect our calendar. And it won't. It won't affect my motion either because no, we it, do that okay. now. Okay. We, I mean, we. That's true. We do. We, we do that like now. I just yeah. want to make sure that that We're it's aware. something that's considered. That I just don't want to see us be just jammed. Well, with I, I no, guess we'll see how it goes until yep. ten thirty yep. at night. And we'll I see how it goes. If I it, I'm sure, if it proves to not work, we will. Right. We can revisit it. I think we're good. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay. Um, do I have a motion? Oh, I have a motion from Mrs. Snell. We have a second from Mrs. Black. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> abstain. Me? Aye. Aye. I'm abstaining. Yes, I'm abstaining. You're abstaining. I abstained. Okay, so it's six zero one. Hmm. Okay. Thank um, you. I, I have a point of order. <laughs> yes. Okay. You're not dissenting, you're abstaining. I am abstaining. I that didn't, I thought you couldn't just abstain. I thought you, you could only abstain if there was a reason. 
Right. I have a reason. What's your reason? I'm not quite sure that those I items that well, I just brought up. Well, then you should dissent, shouldn't you? Then you no, should say no. I'm just abstaining. I don't have. I don't. Oh, I thought. You know, okay. I don't have to. I don't. I don't have to give a reason for abstaining. I just abstained. I thought, I you, thought did, you have to have a reason to check abstain. Check yeah. I don't think you have I'll to. I'll check that out. Um, but I will leave it as six zero one for now until I've done the research and I will come back and let the board. Know. Would you like me to change my vote? Because <laughs> I don't want to. But I will be if you're forcing me no, to change my a, vote. No, just it's not a forcing. It's over. just a point of order. But it was a point of order. We've got six. We have we have a majority, so it's going to pass, and we're good. Item eighteen C. Board policies. Um, Mm -hmm. Do we? Okay, they're all they're all separate. So excellent. So first, we will have Dr. Jockum. <coughs> Formally declined to vote either or or for against. I don't know how to sits on the go fence. back to this. this is there you Jake go. Stuff. There's a PDF on the screen somewhere. There. <laughs> on your t uh, on the there it is. There you go. Da, 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 da. Um, good evening, mm -hmm. board. Mm -hmm. um, we are back to the riveting conversation of <laughs> board policies. And um, if you blink, you will miss the changes in uh, board policy 5113.2a, which is about student work permits. Mm -hmm. And um, again, we're using the opportunity to go through all of our policies and update them. And I think the last time this one had been updated was 2009. So there aren't mm. a lot of changes to it, but we feel it's always uh, a good option to review them and update them, put the new date on them so that we know the last time that we've reviewed them. So I know that all the board members have had this information for a couple of weeks. Were there any questions on, um, on this one? Mm -mm. Otherwise, uh, I would entertain a motion to approve um, and waive the second reading. So move. Second. Mrs. Black moved. Mrs. Yelsey seconded. Any oh. discussion? Okay, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? And yes, for the record, Mrs. Floor could abstain by definition. Um, Thank you. Just doesn't know by the way. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. We're going to move on to board policy 5125.1A, which is the release of directory information. And um, again, if you blink, you'll see the only change in this policy is uh, one education code and the reference to the Board of Education. Questions, comments, or a motion and a waiving, please. Motion to approve board policy 5125-1. And waiving the second reading? Yes. Second? Second. second. <laughs> Moved by Mrs. Yelsey and waiving second reading. Seconded by Mrs. Floor. Any discussion? Yeah, I, just, I wanted just a little bit more clarity on the second paragraph where it says the superintendent or designee may release student directory information to representatives of the news media or nonprofit organizations in accordance with the board policy. Can you explain that a little, just really quickly? I can, I can explain that. So oh, the, sorry, which paragraph? Uh, second paragraph. Second paragraph. You, uh, <laughs> but um, the uh, district has the uh, authority to ask the board to identify certain information as directory information. So some boards identify all the graduating classes as directory information and have list of graduates on their on their websites. Uh, so if you were to have if these any of these were uh, were uh, directory information, we could release that to anyone who asks for it. So uh, right now we're we don't have blanket directory uh, uh, releases. Uh, we do release to identified groups. So for example, we release a list of students to the armed forces. Uh, especially after kids take the ASVAB. So uh, that uh, gives us the authority to follow. So uh, if it's approved as a directory, we can release it, but it's not, no, there's not a lot of, there aren't very many blanket uh, uh, directory approvals in the district. Okay. 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 Mrs. Ms. Anderson? That's okay. Okay. Um, call for the vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? 7 0 0. Thank you, Dr. Jockum. You are welcome. Thank you. 
Career Technical. Mr. Vossen, you're up. Get it set up. There you go. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everybody. So um, just to follow up from the, the last meetings, uh, are there any questions for the CTE policy? Should I make a motion first? I think you should. Okay. Um, I move to approve <coughs> BP 6178 Career Technical Education. And waive. Policy. And waive. And waive the first. Waive the second. Second. Wait, the second reading, okay. Do I hear a second? And the third. I'm waiving the third, okay. too. Um, <laughs> Wait, second it. Mrs. Black second. Okay, there you go. Okay, now you can talk about it. <laughs> do we have any discussion? No, I think oh, you we... guys did a good job. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? All right. All right. Yay. Thank Yay. you. Yay. Well done, Ed. See, that team. was painless, wasn't yes. it, Mike? <laughs> you just have to wait till 8.30 to have it happen. I think uh, Mr. Boston has the record for quickest board policy approval. Oh, I don't know. Dr. Jockham did the last time. That's true. I think it's the person that goes last. So we'll I think to... I think we put him through the, the drill yeah, last did. time. Yeah, we pretty much took he care of it during sweat, the edit team meeting. He was sweating it. Exactly. All righty. Mr. Holcomb. You are asking the board. You are asking the board to ratify an agreement with California Waters Development. Mm. Can you give us some background? I sure can. Um, mm. This this contract. Thank you, first off, to the board for trusting us uh, back last fall as we mm. were getting started with design to give me the authority to enter into this contract on the district's behalf, so we could keep the project moving. We did that about a week and a half, two weeks ago. Uh, so that the contractor can begin work this weekend. Oh, great. And uh, it, we're very excited that, uh, uh, as you'll recall, the project, we redesigned it to bring it back within the budget that was originally uh, established for the pool. And uh, after a lot of work, we were able to do that. So we're very excited that that first portion of the pool contract uh, is covered. This is for the pool. You also, uh, whereas at our other schools, the shade structures and other improvements took some years after the initial construction of the pool, uh, you approved an additional amount to the budget to allow us to do that work as well. That work is under design right now and will be submitted to DSA so that it can proceed along with the rest of the project. Uh, so uh, very successful uh, implementation of this project at this point. We look forward to getting under construction. May. We do. Mrs. I think maybe Mrs. Snell might want to move this. Oh, one. yes. <laughs> I would. I would like to uh, move to ratify the agreement with California Waters Development Inc. for general contracting services for the Estancia High School Aquatic Center increment one, <laughs> which is the pool <laughs> project. Do I hear a second? Second. Mrs. F Mrs. Snell moved. Mrs. Floor seconded. Any discussion? All those in favor? Oops, oh, oh, oh. there is. Go ahead. I just, well, I just, so I was noticing the February 1st, 2020 deadline. So I would just love as we're ratifying that we're kept up to date so we can make sure that we're relaying that back to our community that, that you know, as we get closer to that, that it is on schedule, that there aren't delays, just that process. Yes, we'll, we'll keep you up to date on the project. Uh, that's the contractor's completion date. Every now and then uh, we run into something, especially when we're uh, digging in soil. Uh, it's mm. possible to find something there that we couldn't have anticipated originally, uh, which sometimes delays projects a little bit. We hope that won't be the case mm -hmm. here, but we will keep you up to date. Mr. Holcomb, if uh, we miss, if we aren't able to hit that date, do we have to amend the contract? We would have to amend the contract. That's correct. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Yay. <laughs> uh, mm. Abstain? <laughs> Thank you. All righty. Uh, Mr. Drake, any background for <laughs> approving the agreement for math support? Yes. Uh, over the last several years, as, as you know, under your direction, um, we've both adopted highly aligned, high quality instructional materials. And I've also spent uh, an enormous amount of time, effort, energy um, in, in supporting teachers aligning their instruction. 
um, uh, not only with the, the materials but also with with our standards. So, part of that process uh, is is involved um, in mathematics. Is is our sixth grade math. Um, what I call a transition uh, assessment that all sixth graders for years have been taking prior to moving on to middle school. Um, that assessment has not been rewritten in several years and has not been rewritten to align to our state standards. So we are um, in relation to work that needs to be done, spending uh, two days um, under the direction of our coordinator of, of curriculum and instruction, uh, Gabe Del Real. Um, principals and representative teachers in the district are going to spend two days rewriting that assessment to align, um, as well as coming up with communication out to parents uh, and staff in, in administering that test at the end of May. Um, all the other pieces will also be uh, very similar to as they have been in the past in reporting out scores, um, both to the receiving middle schools uh, as well as to families uh, in the summer. Um, and then the middle schools will use that information and all the other multiple sources of information they use to make sure that the students transition into the appropriate um, math course in middle school. Do I have a motion? So moved. Mrs. Floor moved. Do we have a second? Second. Mrs. Black seconded it. Did it. Did. Um, discussion, Mrs. Yelsey. Yeah, I just want to, for clarification, want to make sure that everybody is aware or confirm for me that this is happening, that even though this assessment for sixth graders will change, that the math curriculum oh. for middle school is not changing. Because I've had that question from mm -hmm. the community. I want to clarify your question. Illustrative mathematics is the curriculum that we use in middle school. That is not changing. Okay. No. Is that and the question will, you're and, asking? Well, That's and it. also <laughs> there will be an accelerated class. That the math you. pathways right. are staying the same. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. Floor. Um, thank you, because that's the same question I have. Um, it would be really behoove us, I think, for us to have a conversation about that, because the implementation of the math pathways as they stand now varies from every single one of our elementary school, uh, uh, middle schools. Okay. Our middle schools have uh, a seventh, eighth enhanced math class, which they do, uh, but at one school, it's seventh and eighth grade all at the same time, it's delivered seventh and eighth. At another middle school, I believe uh, at, at, Mr. Hale, at Dr. Haley's uh, uh, middle school, um, program. It is, they receive seventh grade math in the, it's an enhanced math class, but they read, they receive seventh grade math in the first semester, and they receive eighth grade math in the eighth grade, in the, uh, the second half of the seventh grade. So they're getting both seventh and eighth grade at the same time. Um, they have two periods because they have the, the ability, um, and they get 330 minutes of, of math. Um, of enhanced math, whereas some of the other schools receive far less than that. So I think that I would like some clarity on how um, it is implemented <coughs> um, across the district, because there is some disparity in terms of how it's being um, delivered. And I think that we need some, we need to have some pretty consistent on that. Um, it may not be able to do it, but I know that uh, there's lots of conversations <coughs> of, abounding about that. I'm getting the same questions. Are you getting rid of it? How's it doing? We know that in some instances, in order to, to fill a class because there wasn't enough students in the class, there were other students that were placed in the enhanced math class. Um, and I've gotten that comments from others. So um, again, I just think that we need to have some clarity about exactly the delivery, how it's being implemented, and whether there is some consistency here, because there is some, there are some, there are some differences, um, and uh, I'm in favor of this. I think this is great. I would like to see us make sure that um, this. I particularly liked what I liked about this is that uh, Dr. Hall Callahan's group is going to be doing the scoring and then passing it on. So I think that that's great that it's taken out of our teachers' hands, 
Um, they can make the <coughs> recommendations and all of that like we normally do, but allowing somebody else to actually do the scoring that's sort of non-biased sort of. Um, it's nice it's, to have it's a neutral a, it's person. A, it's a neutral person. I think that's terrific and I like that. But I would suggest that we have some conversations. Um, I'd like a presentation about um, the math, mm -hmm. the math pathway as it stands and whether there's going to be some adjustments in turn. I'm, I don't want to get rid Not of right anything, away. but I do want to have some conversations about Ms. Mrs. Floor, would you be interested in if we collected data on each of the different delivery systems and read what and figure and, and understood what that data exactly. showed. I would. That. That would um, so I don't know how far back we can go or whether we need to go forward for a couple of years, but it would be good to see some trends on exactly. the, each of the delivery systems mm -hmm. so that you would have a, uh, a track record of what each is accomplishing. And then, because what what we want to do, and you know, we follow the DeFore model with the public, uh, with the uh, professional learning team communities, uh, and that's what Rick DeFore would would, would recommend: exactly. collect the data, and then review the data to see what's in the best interest of and, students. And the comparison, yeah, the best of practices too. Yeah, and, yeah. The, and the comparison of the of the time that's spent on on, on these, because so, there are some disparities. So I'm going to ask our team uh, after this administration of this uh, spring exam to go back and see how many years we can look at and maybe make a recommendation how many more years we need to look and so you have uh, uh, some some data that you can look at and, and we can appro approach this with an informed uh, uh, at least set of, of data. Great. Thank you. Um, Bartow. Quick discussion. I just know I looked at the dates and I must have not read properly. This is for tomorrow and Thursday that we're approving this? <laughs> Yes. So it's so if we said no, the, the, they would have to cancel. The group will meet. The group will meet tomorrow and Thursday to rewrite the uh, exam. The test isn't going to happen. Right. The test is not happening. I just feel like the test will be at the end of May. Yeah, that's fine. I just, I'm sure you're under a deadline. It just feels like a little more time would have been helpful, you know, in case we had said no. Okay. <laughs> just speaking from experience, if we, if we say no, they'll, they'll go to Plan B. <laughs> but um, any any further discussion? Okay, um, it was moved by Mrs. Floor, seconded by Mrs. Black. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Okay. <clears throat> Phew. They can they can go forward. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, Community input on non-agenda items. We have, just making sure. Oh. Do I have to read it? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> yes? Yes, you do. Okay. Sorry. This is an opportunity for the public to address non-agenda topics within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Per board policy 9323, each individual <laughs> speaker <clears throat> we'll have three minutes. Speakers may not cede unused minutes to other speakers, and there is a maximum of 20 minutes of comments per topic. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to speak. In compliance with board policy and the Ralph M. Brown Act, the board is not permitted to take action on non-agenda items. When addressing the board, it is helpful if you state your name and address for the video record. Thank you. Whoops, mm -hmm. my turn. Um, Joseph Diakino. And, and if I didn't pronounce it right, it's because you didn't spell it right. <laughs> 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 or, or you're printing. I'm it's back to your third grade teacher. And Mr. Ramirez, yes. I realized that. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> you are with him, but you. We're, we're a double act. Yay. But, okay. Yes. But you. And right. Since, so. Okay. Rather than go up and sit back. Yeah. Joe DeQuino, uh, Newport Harbor High School can be my address for the record. Uh, <laughs> my name is Christopher Ramirez. I am the uh, theater technician for Newport Harbor High mm. School as well as Costa Mesa High School. Okay. Uh, we actually um, came tonight to invite all of you to see in the Heights. I think mm. since we sat through two and a half hours of your show, <laughs> you should sit through ours. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> Much show. more fun. Um, what we wanted to share also is um, this show, when we spoke about it last year and decided our season, is the first um, bilingual production done at Newport Harbor. And um, 
the unity of the students and the team that we put together, uh, Chris included, <coughs> and it's just been a, a beautiful experience for them. It's also the first show in about a decade that's been invited to perform at the Macy's Awards. Um, Tony Awards, Oscars, um, yeah. 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 Awards. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. So um, we that's don't great. charge for anyone that's on the board, anyone <laughs> at the district, the other teachers and staff at the schools. Uh, it, it's important to note, I, and I wanted yeah. to make this point for the record, that yeah. we, we hear a lot of the words inclusion, we hear a lot of the word diversity. Um, I guarantee you arts programs, please come visit our arts programs because they are the most diverse, they are the most inclusive. You have every racial makeup, uh, sexual orientation, uh, financial situation uh, in, in the district, all working together for a single goal. Not that other programs don't do that, but in our world, we, we see this every day. And I, I mentioned to um, President Matoye that we actually had three different high schools on Saturday working on one show. One from Estancia, uh, a middle schooler from Costa Mesa who ran our most important spotlight, and <laughs> a, a team that we put together of, of students and technicians from that's Newport great. Harbor. Oh, so, that's great. And two elementary kids, one at uh, Ensign and one at Newport. Um, the one Elf. on the beach. Ensign is Elf. middle school, though. Yeah, middle school Elf. and then an elementary. Yeah. But the, the gist is this. We've got a great program. We don't charge the kids. We don't have any uh, suggested donations, none of that nonsense. Uh, the money doesn't count. It's what you, the time you put in. Mm -hmm. And we'd like you to come and see that. And especially the M&O guys that you've probably gotten enough emails from me saying, this has to get fixed. That's, I want you to see why, <laughs> all right? Yeah. It's, 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 we care that much because of what the kids are doing. And yeah. I want you to celebrate that and not feel what like, dates? Jesus Christ, he's got another message coming to me. No um, praying at school, no. Right, uh, but just, we're here for that. And we're proud of it. And we'd like you to be, uh, come and see what we're proud of. Right? Thank, Thank you. you for that. Normally we don't ask public to do this, but when are the next, when are the dates, please? We have Friday, oh, tomorrow we have a pickup show at 3.30. Uh, okay. That was me um, asking a question. Show. Friday is a pickup show at 3.30 that's open for most of the faculty that don't want to come back at night. Oh. Uh, 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 Wednesday, I'm sorry. Friday and Saturday shows are at 7 p.m. Food trucks start at 5. Right. Yeah, Sunday oh, matinee nice. is the closing show where we'll also announce next year's season, which we've already included, That's including a, um, And celebrate our seniors as well. We have celebrate the that seniors, celebrates our seniors with the roses. And that was my other question. When did you select <coughs> this, when did you select this play? Last June. See? Actually, no, last April. Last April. Last April. Then we put it on the, box, on the books when we did the schedule. It, it wasn't contrived. It was part, it was no. intrinsic, and I wanted to make that it wasn't contrived. a comment. Thank you very Thank you. much. Yes. So Thank you. one tomorrow at 3.30? 3.30 tomorrow, just walk in, no seats, no <coughs> reservations. For Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, either email mm -hmm. Sean or email me, and I res we do reserve seating so that uh, you have a nice seat set mm -hmm. for everybody, not just for you guys on that. Okay. Um, and the public you. can come, too. Yeah, public, yes, please, public yeah. out there, come. Yes, uh, please, everybody come. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's cute. Yeah, that was um, so good. I will uh, tell you that, um, thank you, we encouraged, uh, these two gentlemen to come, yeah. um, as well as we said, tell Rafi to come and talk to us about it too. So that's why you had it in student board members because Shar and I had the opportunity to go um, see it on Saturday night, and it is outstanding. Um, fabulous choreography, fabulous lighting. Met the young woman who, first time she's being a <coughs> stage manager and did an outstanding job. Uh, the young man that was doing some of the lighting was actually on loan from Estancia <coughs> High School. Um, just a fabulous, fabulous production. Dance, everything was just great. And they had the just received uh, word, they did the performance on Friday night and received word that they were the last show that the Macy's came in. That's a big, that is a big, big deal. deal. It was established yeah. by the Children's Found, uh, Foundation. Um, they've been in competition for a long time and this was great and they received and they're the 91st, the, the, there's 91 schools. 22. Um, so, it's great. And this was written by Lynn Manuel Miranda, so you can imagine the dialogue and the rap mm -hmm. that the kids had to learn. <laughs> it's, it's, it's great. It's it was wonderful. And I was also there Friday night. It was phenomenal. <laughs> so I, it yeah, night. it was it was so good. I told everyone I knew they should go see it.
Great. There you go. Thank you very, very much. All righty, board member reports. Um, Mrs. Snell, would you like to report? Sure. I mean, it's very sure. linear tonight, but. It is so linear. It, it works. Next time you can start with Ashley. Oh, okay, yeah. fine. I'll do it alphabetically. Okay, so um, <laughs> a couple, just a, a couple of things. I have a bigger report for the city district meeting, and okay. I don't know if you want me to do that now or later. Do that one later. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So um, just a couple things that um, um, there's a new DVD video um, out documentary that was made called Three Seconds Behind the Wheel. <laughs> and um, it is it is acclaimed. Um, it's uh, about they took eight drivers from teens to my age. And they young. young, and they followed them. Um, they put them on video every time they were in their car, and it's about distracted driving. Oh, yeah. And it is really eye-opening because um, even people my age get distracted. So um, I, I would like to check. I don't know um, what um, videos we show in. Is it health class we address this? Um, but it might be something um, that we would want to look at because um, it's new and, uh, but it talks about um, the main, uh, one of the main reasons is people obviously want to check their phone and it's really difficult for them not to. It's like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so right. it talks about ways to put do not disturb on there, but um, very interesting. Then the other thing, this happened a while ago, a tragedy um, on Harbor um, Freeway, um, I'm mean, Harbor Freeway, San Diego Freeway on the Harbor exit. Um, a woman got in an accident, and I know you all read about it in the paper. Um, it sparked a conversation with my kids. But they got in an accident. Um, she was with her daughter, and she was in the lane, and she got out of her car yes. and went around, and a car came up and hit her and killed her. The daughter was not even injured. And I've been in accidents, and you do, uh, and you're in the lane, and especially on the freeway, you have this, this um, you want to get out of the car. You think like, if you don't get out of the car, <laughs> you're going to get, somebody's going to hit you. And uh, so it sparked a really good conversation with my kids about if you get in an accident on the freeway, stay in your car. And um, so anyway, I thought that was, I found that extremely interesting and tragic and, um, and, and, and it happens. It happens. People get out of their cars and they get hit by a, a car. So, Thank you. Um, so that, that's it until I do my report. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Anderson. Hello. Um, so there's two things. In celebration of Earth Day yesterday, um, the city of Costa Mesa um, and a few others are trying to have May 8 designated as Bike to School Day. Um, and in the past, we've done some walk to school initiatives. Um, and so that is something, too, that please spread the word. We, we would love to have as many kids as possible. This came out of the Costa Mesa. There's a walkability and bikeability committee. Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of discussion on ways that we can get more people walking and biking in our neighborhoods. Um, and so even just, you know, we have a lot of kids that are bused from their schools or to their schools. And so just even to have one day where we are walking to school or biking to school um, and seeing the awesome impact of that. Um, and then I have two things that I am interested in us possibly discussing. Um, we have, we've talked about what highly effective boards focus on academic achievement and learning and not so much on facilities and budgets. And so I know we do a lot with things in alphabetical order. And so currently business services precedes education services on our agenda. And sometimes that takes a while to get through. Um, and as we're going back to focusing on some education, getting the reports, really hearing, hearing clearly and putting the focus on student learning and achievement, I would love for us to have a discussion about changing that order. Um, and then also um, within Costa Mesa, there is um, something that I would love for us to mm -hmm. talk about um, in co coinciding with the opening of the new Costa Mesa library. Um, the city of Costa Mesa and 
um, Melinda Hogue and hopefully the district. Um, but the city is going to be doing a resolution to declare that Costa Mesa is a place for early childhood education. Um, and so to have that be part of when they open the library, the city, the school district, the local community is all wrapped around that. Um, so I'd love to discuss that or put that on the agenda for next time. The library opens the 24th, so we have one more meeting before we could do that. So those are my updates. Can I ask comments. a quick, I, I wanted to cl ask oh, her a yeah. clarifying question. So you, in reordering the, are you talking about the consent calendar? Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. And, and Dr. Navarro and I had already discussed that because we heard your suggestion. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we can do in agenda prep. We can rearrange the order in because yes, I think it was two agendas ago we said, why is it in this order? And it's because it was alphabetical, <laughs> which is absolutely why they teach biology, then chemistry, then physics, which is another really good reason. Algebra, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, algebra then geometry. Is that true? Algebra, that's true. And algebra, algebra then geometry, geometry, then trig. Mm -hmm. Alphabetical. Okay. And when you think about logic, it's just mind fuddling. Yeah. But Mine. thank you. I like those suggestions. Great, thank you. Mrs. I would love Barto. to see that change. I just have a short report. Um, I visited, since our last meeting, uh, five schools. I'm working my way through. So it was a really great juxtaposition. Um, thank you, Veronica, for making such a good juxtaposition of our schools. Um, it was, I visited T. Winkle, uh, Davis, Early College, and College Park. It was uh, really eye-opening to see, you know, we're, they're all new Newport Mesa schools. They all have students. We all mm -hmm. teach the same curriculum. Such different <coughs> student populations, such different um, passions among the students mm -hmm. and the teachers. It was really cool uh, to see what diversity we have in our school district and what unique programs. I, you know, I had heard of early college. I mm -hmm. hadn't really thought about it since I was in high school myself. Um, seeing it in, in practice was just so unique. So um, appreciated that. Pretty cool. And then um, in the heights, again, was going to be one of my highlights, mm -hmm. such a wonderful play. Um, I, I had high expectations, and it exceeded my expectations, so it was yeah. really good. Um, and then also I attended the Class Act Family Night at Newport Coast, uh, a really well done program, and what a great um, <coughs> community we have. And the Pacific Symphony <coughs> is such a wonderful organization and watching them partner with our students uh, was fantastic. I had had season tickets to um, the family musical mornings at Pacific Symphony with my own kids for probably eight or ten years and uh, it was nice to see some of the same songs that my kids enjoyed. <laughs> Thank you. Mrs. Yelsey. Am I missing? You're missing your little. You're missing your little. Put your nose on it. <laughs> oh, what, um, you well, here we go. Uh, oh, muffled. Okay. Um, first, I just want to invite people to join me and a group that we are going to participate in the Newport Beach Hometown Special Olympics again. We had it last year. And um, I got I formed a team with Candy Barella, Carrie Adams, and Bonnie Hinton, and we are a team again. We're fierce competitors in mini hoop shoots, um, <laughs> but uh, but I encourage other people to join along. It's at the Newport Beach Civic Center. It's on May 9th from six oh. to nine o'clock, and mm -hmm. we have Special Olympic athletes there, and they do a whole. Um, torch run through the park up where the bunnies are and everything at the Civic Center. It's really, really, it's very cool. The kids really get into it. <laughs> then they have the mini hoop challenge, which is a fundraiser. Um, and Newport Rib has a dinner. And the CDM drum corps is playing. The, the Sparkles cheerleaders are going to be there. Um, it's really a fun event. So well, if anybody else wants to form a team, <laughs> they can. It's three hundred. It's three hundred and seventy-five dollars to form a team of four people. But if you just want to come, you can also donate as an individual and just participate in the walk. But it's really great. You can go to sosc.org/newporthometown for more information. If anybody wants to join, the other thing is um, yesterday. I was at, as was mentioned by um, our rep from 
uh, Corona Del Mar. Uh, Denise Pope from Challenge Success, she's a co-founder of Challenge Success and also the Dean of Education at Stanford, spoke to a large audience at uh, in the CDM Theater. Dr. Baumeister was there with me, and it was really a great presentation. Um, she talked about how uh, can we have a healthy, balanced approach to college um, admit to the college admissions process. And it wasn't just for high school students. There were a lot of elementary school parents there, middle school parents, and high school parents. She spoke to all three and talked about the stresses of kids. As mentioned earlier, she had also met earlier in the day with the teachers and with the, with the ASB kids and the crew club kids. So she had done different, asked them different questions mm -hmm. about what was important to them, and it's interesting what's important to them and what's important to their parents can be very different. Um, anyhow, Stanford also did a research project, and it's called, the paper is called, a, in quotations, fit over rankings. And they looked at rankings of colleges and getting into college. Mm. And what they determined that it doesn't matter what college you go to, it's, it matters what you do while you're there. And so it kind of telling parents, if your kids want to be successful, they're not going to be successful just by going to an Ivy League school. <laughs> if they want to go to a school that where their passion is more addressed and that they're going to be more involved, they should think about that. And they can be equally or probably more successful there. She gave an example that I remember. Um, she said people who want to be involved in their newspapers, so they want to go to Northwestern because that's very big in journalism. She goes, but every high-powered school sends kids to Northwestern in journalism. If you go to another school and you can be the editor of the newspaper, <laughs> you get more out of it. So just things like that. And I think parents left with a real sense of hmm kind of almost relief, like, yeah, we should look at other things. And it should be our child that decides, not the parent that decides. And it's very appropriate right now, because everybody's waiting to make these final decisions on May 1st. And I even talked to some parents last night who were concerned because their kid, their student wanted to go, thought he wanted to go somewhere, and maybe a parent who was an alumni of another school, wanted them to go there, and the other parent is like caught in the middle of it, this happens. So That, that hasn't been working out so well yes, for a lot so of people. Yes, so it really should be up to the student. But um, in addition to that, Challenge Success is really doing some great things. And I know at Newport Harbor, they're doing some great things. And we have the Human Relations Task Force hopefully doing some great things. I, you know, I know it's, it's moving along at a, not a hu hugely rapid pace, but I just want to reiterate that we have a real opportunity here to make a difference, and I think we need to keep everybody on track to make sure that we get positive results from this, um, not only in terms of, of the programs we're going to do, but the curriculum that we're going to put in place for the district as well. I know John and his team are working on that. But I just want to keep us moving because I do think we have a real opportunity here and I don't want to miss it. That's my report. Mrs. Black? Well, I don't really have a report after that. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but um, on the first, I missed the very first um, human relations meeting because I thought it was important because our teachers and students, mm -hmm. that at least one board member was at our spring concert in the Newport Harbor Zone. Mm -hmm. And so it was packed house. It was wonderful. And um, we had from everybody in the zone, the, the students, I mean, I we're going to have to get a bigger stage. And... Uh, we don't want to get Martha started or Vicky started on that because we were saying we need a bigger theater, <laughs> and uh, because it was really great and all students are invited to come and and uh, and perform and I mean I'm getting the chills thinking about it because these kids are so dedicated and excited to be there. And what a great experience for them! But I also want to recognize. Um, they are our teachers that were there, so we know they were doing double time as well. And so Sarah um, Grenier, I think is her pronoun. She's our, she's our. I knew somebody. Either you or Martha were going to correct me, but um, 
She's the music director at Ensign Intermediate, and so she had a whole group. And then also um, Tam Tamara F um, Fairbanks from um, from Mariners, and then Colin Hacker, who was the uh, music specialist from Newport Heights, brought a group, and he also played the trumpet you know, helping some of the students. It was great. And then Donald Funk from uh, Whittier. He's the music specialist from Whittier. And then Carolyn Hansen from Kaiser and Ken um, Bodie from Newport. But we also were, we had a student teacher, per, you know, uh, lead a group. Um, and I'm going to probably mess her name up too, but it's Arielle, I think, De La Torre. And she's a student teacher at Ensign and Mariners. And she did, she was very composed. She did a great job. So it was great. And then our conductor the whole time was our uh, Jeffy, Jeffrey Linden. So he's, um, I know him through our student advisory committee. So mm. it was fun to see him in that role. But, um, and then I also then attended the human relations second meeting and Dr. Bauermeister did a great job. Um, I think people are kind of like, okay, when are we getting to the meat and potatoes of this? So we got, um, I thought that was really, really great. And uh, so then I have DLAC and um, student advisory this week coming up. And um, I know that we're looking at the clock, but um, I really am inspired, if you will allow me. I can wait till the end if you want. But we have <coughs> an oh, alum fine. that sent this letter, and we all got, I think we all got a copy of it. And, but if not, I just thought it so moves me. I actually have it on my desk at work and in my room. And he's the um, Newport Harbor High School class of 1974, and he is um, Thomas Harrison Morse, and, and he's a professor at the University of Alaska in, in Anchorage. And, um, and he sent this, he gave us permission um, to read it. And um, so if you don't mind, I'd really like to read it. I'd or, love or, you to read that. Okay. So, um, he wrote, the, and, and he was also, you know, very, um, I, I, you know, just very, I don't know the word, um, you know, like, you really need to hear this, you know, or he was, um, he didn't really send it in a formal letter um, to us, but um, he just, he was very motivated to write it to us based on our um, situation, so I thought that was mm. amazing. Um, there are no human races, only human beings, and the concept of race, that physical feature determines intelligence, ability, character, does not exist in science. The mapping of human DNA shows that there is no gene for race, nor gene for Negro, Asian, Caucasian, etc. The DNA associated with skin color, facial features, body types, et cetera, is a small fraction of the human genome and does not correlate to anything else. From, oh, I'm gonna get this one. From Dachowski, I think it is, humanity is infinitely diverse and resists classification. The concept of race is, is culture, cultural, not biological not scientific, it was created to justify the discrimination, persecution, and slaughter of those who look, think, or act differently. The terms mixed race, in quotes, mixing of the races, in quotes, inferior slash superior races, and interracial marriages are from a brutish, ignorant past and should have no meaning today. The only inferior people are those who persecute others. Likewise, marriage is about love and commitment. It has nothing to do with skin color, ethnicity, religion, or gender. The science used to justify race is fraudulent, propped up by bigotry and greed. It always has been. There are no human races, only human beings, and all human beings need self-expression purpose and recognition as much as they need food and water. From Shakespeare, none can be called deformed, but the unkind. He gave the best dialogue to the outcast and persecuted of society in order to turn society upside down. So Thomas Morris, Harrison Morris, I just thought that was he took the effort to do that and because he was so concerned about his school. You know. oh, but anyway, you. and I will send you all a copy if you'd I like. Think we did we did, did you guys get it? Yes. Okay. Now that we heard it. Now that we read it again. Yeah. 
Thanks. But thanks for indulging me. I thought it was good. Welcome. This is Floor. Let me go back to my notes here, a couple of things. A um, couple of questions I have is um, we've been reading a lot about the Newport Aquatics, um, and I know that we have sailing teams, and organ you know, we have a couple of teams, and so I'm just wanting to make sure that we are aware of what's going on and that we're just sort of following it because we have uh, two schools that have aquatics teams and I believe they are out of uh, the Newport Aquatic Center. And so there's questions and so I just, I, I just want to make prepare sure for that next year. Uh, okay. prepare for next year on that. Uh, second, I want to thank Kirk um, for shepherding the Human Relations Task Force through. I think it's gratifying that we have at this point 27 um, people that have signed a commitment form, um, but again, anybody's welcome to do that. Um, there are a couple of dates that I think several of us have mentioned that conflict with a a graduation or an awards, and so uh, you'll come. Great, um, that that was terrific, and uh, how do I say this politely? Um, uh -oh. <laughs> I think us attending. The, the task force meetings um, is a little redundant. I think that us attending the community meetings, I think those are where we should be be there and hear what's what those, those community meetings. But I think that sometimes we sort of get in the way of, of that, the task force and making those recommendations. Um, I also would love our principals who made fabulous presentations to be on camera here and make those presentations. They did an outstanding job of what each of their schools are doing, have been doing, are continuing to do in addressing um, issues that we have been bringing up about race relations and that. And I was just so proud of every single one who was there. They were just outstanding. Um, and amazing the breadth of what they are doing. Amazing the breadth. Um, and then I was particularly gratified at that meeting that there was over 20 high school students, um, Latinos Unidas from our uh, Newport Harbor High School were there in force. There was another group from the ASB from Newport Harbor. I think there was a couple of the students from Estancia. It was just a terrific group of, of students. And I think that they are, they absolutely want to be participants. And I think that they've signed letters. So um, that's just my um, thought on that. Uh, Again, Into the Heights, please go. It's just a fabulous program. Um, well worth the $10 admissions. Well worth it. Um, and then finally, uh, Russell, I hope that you'll spend a little bit of time on the thought exchange because I thought it was fascinating. We got some of the results, the preliminary results back and from, and there was such a diverse, there was a difference from what the students had said mm -hmm. and then the ultimate when the parents were asked the same question, what rose to the top mm -hmm. and what didn't. And I hope that you'll, you'll talk a little bit about that. And if not tonight, if we could have a, um, you know, a conversation or something about that presentation, and I'm looking forward to the, the next one because fascinating responses because I went, oh, and then all of a sudden, what? How did that jump up there? <laughs> it's like, okay. So, okay. definitely mm -hmm. popular, that's on, for sure. On the task force, I just want to thank um, Mrs. Snell and Mrs. Bartow for getting back to me your schedules. And I totally agree with you, Mrs. Floor. I think part of it was from my hearing Dr. Barmeister's charge to the task force saying, "These are this is what you're going to do and you're going to present it to, to the, the board. board. Mm -hmm. And so I went, gee, if we're there, it's kind of like we're influencing what's gonna get presented exactly. to us. So it was like, ugh. But I agree that it's, I looked at the dates and went, oh my gosh, until I realized that this is being chaired by the Orange County Human Relations, relations task force people and we had to defer to the dates they were available for us mm -hmm. and then we'll juggle, juggle it and at least one of us and sometimes two of us will be at everything at least on the community meeting so mm -hmm. I'm kind of like looking at everybody going if you we can take task forces off yeah. mm -hmm. unless there could be the task force could decide at some process that like they want to have a community meeting and not to have our voice there and I think that's where I'm really excited well, to hear that we are community, task, so we can go to task well, force, right, of course. Right, but there could be an opportunity. I think that that is something that, I mean, I don't know how that, I, I just think that there could be. 
that could be something that could be valuable. It I'm, may. I'm not saying. I'm not saying we can't go. I'm saying, I think we could feel not bad about missing the task force meetings, but the community yes, meetings, I'm, the content is so good that I do feel bad when I have to miss them. And we do have a ton of conflicting wonderfulness going on. So, especially this time of but year. But at this time of year, attend, it's okay. But if it's you want okay. to attend, yes, this oh, is absolutely. a community meeting, and we are community members. So we got it. We've got that too. Um, we received a letter to, um, from the Orange County Department of Education, <coughs> not the board, the Department of Education, um, thanking our department. Thank you, Mr. Trader and Mr. Mr. Holcomb, for our timely submission of our second interim report, and they agreed with our assessment that Newport Mesa will be able to meet its final op financial obligations for the current and subsequent two years, and that a positive certification is appropriate, so yay. And we they want to extend their thanks to our staff for a thorough and timely preparation of the second interim report. So kudos, Fiscal, you starred and shined again. And I think that was my entire board member report and we have a few reports and Mrs. Floor, do, I do. can I make you last? I rephrase, I'm making you last. Um, we have, what's, what's new? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what you get for being vice president. You know, I start with Mrs. Snell and we've had a, a liaison meeting and we had our ledge meeting. Um, Mrs. Black, do you have anything on our No, sports? they're all this week. Yeah, they're always they're, after everything the board is, meeting. <laughs> right, so that's perfect. So yeah, we actually had DLAC last week. Last Thursday. Oh, you did have DLAC. So we'll, I'll start and go back this way. It's a pattern tonight. Mrs. Snell, go ahead. Yeah, you do the, you do a different pattern every week. There you, you go. Then it'll remember. be there. Okay. Yeah. This is this pattern. Okay, this, this is pretty brief because I sent you all a little report on... The Did you all get it? Yes. Yeah. On, on what went down. So this is the um, Costa Mesa City and... Um, and Newport Mesa and Sanitary District and Water District. So I think we meet like every quarter and we have different reps each time. Um, so um, anyway, we, uh, the Sanitation District uh, presented um, us with a proclamation recognizing Early College High School for their distinguished school. Um, and I, it's not here though, huh? Did you get? Uh, okay, so that was really nice, um, and um, we talked about, I'm just hitting the high points, um, we talked about Davis-Kaiser uh, Fields renovation and um, the uh, plan from our lawyers is in their court, um, but I was a little disappointed to learn that there is no money to do it. No, yeah. but that's how their proposal was, though. The I had, well, several mm -hmm. several years. I mean, we've been talking about this for Three ever. Years? Yeah. And there was um, some money that they had put aside. But in light of um, all the good work they've done with the homeless um, shelter, uh, there's they've just spent more than, than normal. So um, we'll see what happens <coughs> when... When, if we get an agreement, right? And then I don't know where the money's coming from. There was one detail uh, that, that mm -hmm. um, they did they did uh, fund the, the design portion of it. Oh, so they yeah. can't no, come they up with they can't come up with a design. Yeah. Yeah. They just don't have the money for uh, put aside for construction. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's how we that's what we that's yeah. how No, and they also funded the feasibility study. Right, that's right. And the design. Okay, well, I, this was something I thought we were going to get done. I mean, wait till Brett Eccles hears about this. Um, okay. I'm not sure. Was... <laughs> <laughs> he knows because we had a discussion about it at the Costa Mesa United. Oh, good. The, yeah. He knows there's no yeah. money? No, okay. they all know. They okay, all know good. that it's slow boat to China like yeah. any government. Yeah, it's kind of a shame. Um, <laughs> Is it just slow? They don't have the money, but they didn't, they, you know, I'm I not I thought they had money. Anybody. They had money at one time. The, they had a proposal, but they were talking about the feasibility initial, initially. They've never had the construction money 
Oh, Dr. that's Navarro. not the way but, I understood it, but yeah. okay, yeah. whatever. Well, they're hoping. <laughs> Um, the other thing is um, uh, Mayor Foley brought up the JUA, um, and we had discussed, we've talked about redoing the JUA. In fact, we had a presentation. I think, Kirk, Dr. Bauermeister, you gave the presentation. Somebody gave the presentation. It's an ongoing conversation. It's an ongoing conversation time. anyway, because there's time. several JUAs. They're mm -hmm. different. Um, and so um, I, I would like to suggest um, that we put together a committee of three board members is I don't is it not called a committee ad hoc. <laughs> ad hoc committee that can um, get started on the details of this I mean obviously we all have to be in on it but um, <coughs> there's just so much going on uh, but we need to uh, the city is asking for more time on our fields, and uh, I just want to, the last, the last study we did, the fields were pretty used on our, in our campuses. So, and we were look, I was looking forward to these two additional fields being opened for all the kids in uh, Newport Mesa. And now it looks like that's, many years away. So um, anyway, I would like to request that you think about that. <laughs> um, and then um, July 3rd, um, uh, Councilman um, Stevens talked about the July 3rd Independence Day celebration. And um, it is at OCC, I mean, OC Fairgrounds. <coughs> and I don't know if any of you have gone before. This is the third year. Uh, they didn't have it last year. They didn't? Oh, oh he said it was the third other. year. Okay, whatever. Right. Um, but anyway, it's a free admittance. They, they really, they expect like 5,000 people and there's fireworks and he's inviting community groups from the school to comp schools to come and set up a table. The, the details haven't been released yet. They're still working it out, but he assured us it would be free, that they could set up the tables and and they could be informational. Like you could, we could set up a CTE table that talked about our CTE pathways, or it could be a booster. I know most of the major boosters are in fireworks booth, but there's a lot that don't have that connection. And so, um, and he said they could sell food or whatever. So more details to follow, but I just wanted to give that heads up to um, the community that um, this is a way to make a little money and probably have some fun. And um, let me see, is that everything? So that's it. Hey, um, Ms. Andrews. Uh, yes, DLAC. Going, yes. What were you gonna I want to echo though two Sorry. things that mm -hmm. Vicki said that mm -hmm. Mrs. Snell said that I thought were very important. So um, I've noticed some other school districts, um, like for the Tet uh, uh -huh. Festival, uh -huh. they did like their Mandarin dual immersion. The kids were there. They did a booth. See, that's and cool. so to have, you know, to have like our dual immersion there, CTE, mm -hmm. so students can be there. Parents can learn about them. That's great. I also agree with the fields, opening up the fields. Um, particularly in the west side, we don't have a lot of parks. And so that's one thing that actually the city has been discussing is how do we have, we just need to have conversations because mm -hmm. we have some kids who have no access to parks at all. And we have open fields that sit vacant. So um, something for another day, mm -hmm. but that's something that's very important mm -hmm. to me personally. Mm -hmm. um, so DLAC was wonderful. It was very informative. Um, Vanessa went through the parent notification letters that parents receive, what they should get at the beginning of the year, what they should get at the end of the year, what to look for. She asked if they wanted changes, um, and this is all part of LCAP, so I love oh, that okay. parents all got a sample. They were able to <coughs> read about language acquisition programs and their ability to request changes um, or dual immersion if they wanted that. So this was wonderful. Um, we went through the federal addendum to our local um, mm -hmm. educational agency plan. And one thing for me that I was really proud of that this year Newport Mesa has elected to invest in a year long needs assessment and planning process during this school year to direct the majority of the Title IV funds towards supporting st safe and healthy students 
the, the students with the greatest needs. So I'm just really excited about this and that this was shared out well. It's bilingual on both sides. It was wonderful. Um, and then also, um, I'm always someone who likes to hear the successes and the challenges. Um, and so there was a form for um, to update. It was the stakeholder input. So it was directly responses that parents had about ELD, ELA, <coughs> if they, um, you know, pros and cons, things were really changing with parent involvement. We have a lot more parents involved. Um, so this was really wonderfully done. And then <coughs> Melinda Ho came and they shared all of, you know, the 48 pages of opportunities and ways that um, families can get cared for at Melinda Ho. So that, it was really great. Um, and then for our um, education committee, we talked through the, um, hmm. I'll actually let Char do that part. I don't want to talk too long. I'm trying to be <laughs> cognizant of time. Um, I'm really excited about the task force, the next piece coming up about implicit bias. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that's we added. all have bias mm -hmm. and to have those conversations is really important. And so um, I'm really looking forward to that. I'm excited that that's the first part of the community workshop. So I'm, I'm very appreciative that that is our direction. Excellent. Ledge report. Mm -hmm. um, Real quick on the DLAC report, I forgot to mention I went to the Ensign uh, sixth grade like new parent thing. So I want I'll be attending the next DLAC meeting because I want to see how the parents felt. Um, there was translation and it, I, it seemed to go well. So I want to make mm -hmm. and they had a speaker. So I want to make sure they felt welcome because it it seemed like they did a good job. Um, okay, ledge report. Um, there's three bills regarding charter schools, AB 1505, 1506, and 1507. Um, 1505, in a nutshell, is a little different than we've been talking about, so I wanted to clarify. It's the, it gives us the ability, but in this case, um, it's the County Board of Education can find that the school district committed a procedural violation. So it's a little different than hmm. just straight out denying that um, appeals process. The mm -hmm. appeals process is still there and they can put it under a procedural violation. So they still do have quite a bit of flexibility. Um, and then they also, but the difference is that they would remand the petition to the school district for reconsideration instead of having the final, mm -hmm. final, final say. Um, and then additionally, they make, they underscore the need for uh, the new, the appeal cannot contain anything new or different material, which is uh, really important because that reflects the charter that we saw come through mm -hmm. with completely different um, information the second, during the appeal. Um, 1506 is a cap on charter schools. And the current law set up a cap of 250 charter schools in 98, 99, and you could add 100 every year. The, appeal, uh, the bill would cap the number of charter schools, both the number of schools at the amount that are in existence of January 1st, 2020, as well as the enrollment. So if the enrollment at a charter school um, was a certain number of people, and then that school came back and wanted to appeal for more, they would be limited to whatever they were approved for beforehand. So it limits it in two ways. Um, and then 1507, um, requires a charter school to operate within the jurisdiction. In some cases, they have come back to that jurisdiction, found that there wasn't the space, and their additional option is to have that district pay for the facilities outside of the jurisdiction of the school district. So that's a, 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 an important bill. Um, there are some CSBA bills that have been co-sponsored. Moving along, there are six currently. The biggest one that we may uh, want to consider a resolution on is AB 1303. Yep. It's to appropriate $450 million to CTE programs at the K through 12 level, mm -hmm. not at the community college level. So that's something to mm -hmm. consider for a future agenda. Um, <laughs> and then there are a few bills, which I'm just gonna go over really quickly because they are, they, they are, will be approved most likely and they're, they will affect us. Um, the least, one was, we'll probably see in our policies, Sarah, is the um, <laughs> at risk will be replaced with at promise for AB 413. So all at risk youth will be reflect changed to reflect at promise instead. At, um, at, 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 at promise. 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 Yeah, so we won't see we high risk or at risk. risk. It'll be at promise. At promise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's a warm fuzzy. At promise. At promise. Well, at promise is. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. promise, yeah. promising. So, yeah, promising. and so then <coughs> AB20 and AB52 reflect the uh, California Computer Science um, Strategic Implementation Plan. The currently um, school districts are required to have a strategic plan and implementation at a local level. This would require a coordinator at the state level coordinating all the local level um, plans and additionally require those plans to be updated every seven years. Um, AB 198 is, uh, is funny to me because it's a bill requiring uh, career aptitude tests be um, accessible and posted on websites. Currently, this law <laughs> says that you only have to post the information on your website if there's a if it's a line item in the annual budget, um, which makes a lot of sense. Um, and then Welcome to our world. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then SB 138 will require school districts to apply at to supply type one diabetes information in additional in addition to the current type two diabetes information that's already provided. And then SB 541 um, requires annual lockdown drills as part of a comprehensive school safety plan, which uh, local school districts already need to do, but this extends the requirement to private schools and charter schools. Um, the only one that's really uh, applicable to us that is supported, that's in committee, that's not um, necessarily going to be approved is a bill to amend the LCFF to uh, include include a cost of living adjustment of about 5% for the fall. And that's it. Very cool. Comprehensive. Oh, and I, and I cut it way down. Oh, well, no. I, I know. You nice sent job. us a comprehensive nice report. Yeah. This, nice. this is okay. four. We okay, appreciate so it. So I have uh, stuff, stuff to hand out. A um, couple of things um, about 1303. Uh, as you know, we had 300,000 um, in the first, the grant. It was 150 went to K-12, and the other 150 went to the community colleges to be distributed to K-12 programs, all CTE programs. Um, God bless, uh, Patrick O'Donnell has uh, introduced a bill that transfers the $150 million that went to the community colleges as saying, give it to us and move it over, and then increased it to another 150,000. So that's where the hundred, that's where the 450,000 is. And we're very Brilliant. fortunate with the ROPs that both Carol Hume oh, yeah. and Grant Lufkin from Tustin Unified are actually readers on those grants that the community college has, and they have been less than stellar. So there's a good opportunity that um, that that will get the uh, the Hopefully they'll sign the budget, uh, the that 1303 and, and appropriate more money. Um, I'm passing out. Um, I passed them down. Pass them down. A couple of things on here. Um, it's been a very busy month for our students and a very successful uh, month for oh. our, our kiddos in the programs. I wanted to highlight first um, Estancia High School and the construction technology. Um, they participated in their very first as a bit of school. Um, it's the Building Industry Trades Association uh, Foundation. And the kids were charged, these teams, from nine of the high schools in, <coughs> in Orange County um, nine districts uh, to build a garden shed over these specifications. Now, our school, it's their first year in competition, and they took first place. Yay. Um, and I do have a short video, and I will I will forward that up, but they got oh. some great, re so that's this one. Um, then I wanted to tell you that uh, Newport Harbor High School's culinary arts program, which is Julie Patterson and Ashley Kingsbury are RCTE, and Sarah Pylon was a CTE, and now she's a, she's still in culinary, but she's a district uh, teacher. Uh, took nine students to participate in the National uh, huh. Restaurant Association's 2019 Pro Start Invitational on March 15th. And it was two different competitions. One was management, and they had to come up with a theme for um, a concept, and they placed fourth out of 18. And then the second team, uh, which we had the privilege of ha seeing, they have to, um, they have 
60 minutes to prepare a three-course meal using two butane burners. Those are kind of like Bunsen camp burners, stoves. little camp, camp stoves, stoves um, without access to running water or electricity. And then they're evaluated on their taste, their skills, their teamwork, safety, and sanitation, and they placed eight out hmm. of um, 28 um, groups, so that was terrific. Hmm. And then the sports medicine classes Oops. at Estancia High School and Costa Mesa High School were invited to, to, uh, to work with the Hogue Performance Center on March 26th for a hands-on, and they got to work with the Chargers athletic training staff. Ooh. They got to tour the facility, oh, wow. And that was um, with Christina Scooty and Dave McNeil and our sports medicine kids. And then, of course, finally, uh, this design and build, which was a fabulous thing. And I said, well, can we buy the, I know. the I'd like to buy one of those garden sheds because they're plumb, straight, level, perfectly and built. And, and they're safe. safe. <laughs> um, and we want to thank all the people that did it. And then finally on here, uh, we had a presentation. Um, and on here is uh, on the public safety programs that we're doing without throughout our our uh, program. And I wanted to because we got a lot of information on the last one on the EMT with Mr. Yuki. So I wanted you to turn to page 11 on this. But, I mean, this is what we offer uh, emergency medical responder, emergency medical technician, EMT certification. Uh, fire science, safety instructors, but I wanted you to pay attention to uh. number 10, which is the student enrollment in those classes. And in 2018, we have five school districts involved, and we had 123 students involved in those programs. The interesting thing is that um, on slide number uh, 11, which is the National Registry of EMT, it's the national test, and you have to score 80 or above. Please notice that the orange line is the, is the coastline Success. ROP um, pass rate, and they're at 92%. Wow. Uh, nationally, it's at 80%. And the California is at 76%. So our kids, when they pass, they pass this certification as a 12th grader, they are certified to be hired as an EMT. And many do go on to um, that position. And also, we've talked a lot about the mannequin. Um, Dan Zimmerman, who is one of our instructors, who is an LA firefighter, um, his department, and he is a big, he's a trainer, does not even have um, mm -hmm. this Nurse Kelly, which is a 20,000 who talks to you, who vomits, <laughs> who does all sorts of things that we I don't want to know about. <laughs> um, and, <clears throat> Uh, and that's at Estancia High School in that program. And so I know. Can I elaborate on that a little bit? Pretty uh, cool, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Um, uh, Dana and I uh, went to observe um, the CTE pathways at Estancia. So, uh, but we looked in in the medical lab. It was amazing, and uh, they were. He was conducting a class. We wanted to watch him conduct the class. So afterwards, I went back to. I thought it was a man. It's Nurse Kelly, huh? Well, the Nurse Kelly. The, the, be a, the yeah. Nurse Kelly is the mannequin. Yeah. Oh well, it's a man, Melanie. A man. Well, it's they have a male man. nurses. Okay. Anyway, they call them Nurse Kelly. Um, I want. I just wanted to add to that because. Oh yeah. Okay. Because um, they can actually take blood. Blood out of it. I mean, they have to put something in there, but they can actually, you know, do the needle. They um, they can. Um, put in a chest tube, uh, they, uh, and it's all set up like a little hospital room. I mean, it's got monitors, and so for a test, um, the, the instructor has like a, a little iPad, and he simulates um, certain conditions. He can change the heart rate, he can, oh, the tongue swells up. <laughs> I mean, it does everything, and uh, he can simulate it and, and uh, make it do whatever he wants. Plus, he talks for it. He's out of the room, so he can talk 
and they, you know, I can't breathe either, whatever. And uh, they have to do what they need to do to, to, um, to do this, to, yeah, it, it is, it's pretty it amazing. Is, it is state of the art. It and, is. And I think that uh, the most impressive is if you hear from the students who are taking that class, um, several of them are going into the EMT. Uh, one student who came and spoke to us said, I'm going to be a doctor and this is helping me mm -hmm. clearly have a step up because I mm -hmm. now, I understand all of, all of how to work in a, in a trauma room because the kids do in many of these programs, they get to participate, they do ride-alongs with ambulances, mm -hmm. they get to work and shadow in an, an ER. Um, many say, well, this is not really, but it gives this them an opportunity. Yeah, it it gives them an now. opportunity in high school to really solidify what, where their passion mm -hmm. is. And um, as one of the young men said, uh, and you know, they they're women also, but it's interesting because they talk about in terms of fire science. I mean, you're carrying 70 additional pounds of of weight. So these kids are not only they're. They're working out big mm -hmm. time and, and doing all of the information, but I think it's gratifying that our kids mm -hmm. are exceeding and really are at the national standards in terms of what they're what they're doing. And these are just not these are high performance. And, and Estancia, Estancia has like four I don't want to call them dummies, mm -hmm. but they wait. There's Kelly's. There's no, no. no they they don't do any. Yeah. Yeah. They're Annie's. But they're they weigh 200 pounds, and so the kids <laughs> have to learn how to move them, how to strap them in. Uh, it's it's a great class. I just they were all good classes, but yeah, and, and, it's pretty exciting. And Mrs. Fleur, I had in addition to the culinary comments, today's bus driver appreciation. Mm -hmm. Um, event was catered by Newport Harbor oh. Culinary. So as soon as I knew that, then I knew I had to taste it because the food is, was phenomenal. Yep. And definitely diet, <coughs> not. Well, but it was I just delicious. want to thank, you know, our district so. is unusual because we actually fund, um, we have two. We have the ROP, but we also have our own department here. Um, Irvine does not have their own department. They okay. have a part-time individual who works. Um, Keith, their their person is not over, doesn't oversees, but there's no full-time dedicated staff for career and technical education that we have in our college and career. Um, they contract out for all administration to the ROP versus us, which is, has a complete department. And so um, these are great programs that we offer, and um, I know that they are also meeting and talking about looking at how we're funded because they haven't changed how things have been done for many, many years, and so we're trying to make sure that we can reach as many kids as we can and appropriately fund at the same time. So that's the end of my report. Thank you, board members, and I also want to thank you because you made all your board reports actually either talk about the impact on students or our district values or um, legal requirements, constituent interests, and And not, don't get out of your car. And don't and, get out of your, don't get out of your safe, car. And safe, safe, school safe, student safe, safety. Get out of your seat. Impact on students. <laughs> it's not literally impact. Um, and, and relevant, and it, was, it made our not so much fluff. More substance, so good job. Excuse me? No, well, and I'm the Excuse biggest me. one who's guilty of fluff, so that's why I could say you guys did a great job. I know what fluff looks like. Uh, Dr. Navarro. Okay. So a little walk down memory lane for Mrs. Floor, Mrs. Black, and Mrs. Yelsey. Uh, Please don't. <laughs> it, was about, tonight. it was about four years ago. Uh, Couple months past that uh, you dedicated money for uh, the renovation of the field at CDM. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, you're going to have that start this summer. Yeah, it's been a long walk. Don't tease uh, us yeah. anymore. We can't take it. That's also the night you, uh, at my request, put aside a million dollars so we could plan a pool for Estancia because they got nothing out of that renovation. Yeah, that's uh, right. That, that uh, money from. Uh, 
redevelopment. The redevelopment. redevelopment. Twenty-one. Let's remind everybody. It was twenty-one million dollars, and Estancia got a, mil, a measly one million. Yes, but uh, but they have but, since but, gotten but, plenty. But your staff, <laughs> but your team, and you were married. Made it possible, and uh, and, and and got eleven million dollars for you to build. Yeah, a pool that we did. Perfect. Like that. We're yeah. getting that. So it's it's great that was on the agenda today. A lot of work. A lot of years. I don't have, you know, I know, I wish I would have, we could have done these things sooner, but uh, <laughs> it's a process, and uh, you know what, uh, I think we're going to end up with some great projects, the community is going to be very proud of them. Yep. And we'll have ice for the community members, <laughs> which is a huge, old, you know, huge issue for us. Mm -hmm. um, Just in time for Noah when he graduates. He has to move back from Chicago. Um, we could read that. Morning, <laughs> this, this morning I asked my staff. <clears throat> Uh, why do you get up in the morning and come to work? You know, because, you know, I was thinking about those meetings that we had at CDM, actually even the meetings that we had at Anderson and at Adams <laughs> about, you know, increasing security there and some pretty rough nights out there, mm -hmm. you know, some pretty rough meetings. Our first meeting on the CDM pool in the library was really not a meeting. It was more like a hanging. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, you, 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 we all, 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 your whole staff, you alongside of us see these participate in these events when uh, some uh, when logic and reason don't rule the, the, the behavior of, of those that participants and so you wonder sometimes why do I get out of bed and go to and go to work and then so I asked my staff and uh, and I thought what was really interesting is it was we all had the same reason uh, and it's because of things like Jake today mm -hmm. you, know? you don't have your mic I'm oh, so you're sorry. 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 When I don't see the little bubble on there, I lose it. Um, sure, I have it down here. Yeah. So, so, and it was really interesting that you know, and, and Jake was there. He sits on an expanded cabinet, and it was really about you know, the progress that we see. You know, we do see progress. It may not be o an overnight success, but but it is something that uh, happens, and you start to see it, see see it come about. Uh, and in the next couple weeks, uh, and we've been kind of warming up to uh, this issue of uh, student progress monitoring that we're really focusing on. And, uh, and staff is planning some more work. Uh, I know that uh, we uh, would like to bring the secondary back to share what the work they've done on student progress monitoring this year, as well as the work they'll be embarking on with math. And uh, John Drake gave you a nice report on math this last Friday. Uh, what where we are, so um, just you know, just know that we get up in the morning because of the types of things that you see your high schools doing right now, or your elementary schools, or your middle schools, or your coaches that win CIF championships, mm -hmm. uh, and it really is all about the kids, and uh, and ultimately all of the all of the uh, events that we experience, whether they're really really positive or really really negative, are really in 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 in. Uh, part of the process as we get to the place where we actually make our places better for all kids. Uh, and uh, right now we have Kirk leading us through a process that I think is gonna be very important and for many years to come. This is not gonna be an overnight project. This human relations task force is not gonna start anything right away. Just like a board policy doesn't start change right away. But we're, we're planting seeds and we're moving forward and we're in this for the long haul. So uh, really proud of the work that we're doing and that we're starting to see start starting to see it take root uh, and uh, I look forward to where we're going next to next well I believe in front of you you have the personnel commission report yeah. so yes. this is one of our favorite Thanks reports that, yeah. that Kristen Clark and her team put together uh, I will draw your attention to some of the activity over this report represents 1718 not current year. Um, you, you might notice that on the um, left-hand side that the applications received over the last few years have, has decreased. Mm. We actually believe that's because there are lots of jobs available, um, and so we're seeing less of less applicants, but it certainly doesn't diminish the number of exams. So right underneath that, you'll see that we they administered 208 written exams to application to applicants another um, interesting and impressive statistic is 69 eligibility lists created mm -hmm. so as we post a position and create an eligibility list and take everybody through the processes that they have to do in order to 
um, get on an eligibility list. We had 69 that, that new ones that were created. And in the employee actions, which were on the second pa on the um, page on the right hand side, promotions, which is one of the goals of the personnel commission, is to promote promote people within, build that capacity, and you'll see that that num number has um, held steady, and in fact is at 38 in 17-18, which is very impressive. I'll also. Um, draw your attention to the number of athletic assistants that mm -hmm. we put through the office there and that we bring on to our sites to work. So there's lots of good information in this report. Um, and since I only have a few minutes or less, I uh, just wanted to bring some highlights. On the very far right-hand side are some of the other things mm. that, um, that that team works through. I know that you are very familiar with our superstars. Um, today the classified employee of the mm -hmm. year service awards you can see i just think that that's very interesting of how many years of service that shows for the longevity within our within our district years? both that's a combination of certificated and classified okay. when you who had 50 numbers. years of service Do joe robinson oh, oh of joe course. robinson he was here he was the first hired. yeah so wow. years. Years. amazing He's so very three. impressive data um, <laughs> that we just wanted to share with you wow. tonight mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow, thank you. He's still teaching. He's still teaching well. He's still teaching well. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Navarro, for the, the good thoughts about the construction projects. Uh, Ada Zeresny is working very diligently. As you saw, a number of items on tonight's agenda. There will be a number more on, on your next meeting's agendas. <laughs> um, meanwhile, uh, a lot of other work has been going on now with Mr. Bidnick uh, being here for three months. He has, um, he got the opportunity to get out and get some things done over the Easter break, or I'm sorry, over spring break. Mm -hmm. um, and let me find my notes, or we could ask him to come up and tell us, sure. but I he's, can find those very quickly. He's stuck right it out there. this far. He has. Um, <laughs> So uh, there was uh, paving rehabilitation at eight sites uh, over that, including parking lots and blacktop playground areas. Uh, also, um, some of our locations where we have the fall zones uh, around apparatus, mm. those were uh, replaced and renovated over that same period. Uh, also, last Saturday, m and assisted Newport Harbor in their day of service. Uh, including painting, cleaning, and gum removal uh, around the campus. And uh, we opened uh, roof maintenance bids today so that we can uh, get after some more roof condition assessments and preventive maintenance, which is really the theme to the work that Mr. Bidnick has been focusing on, which is uh, approaching our maintenance activities from a proactive uh, standpoint of anticipating what needs to be done and getting out and doing it uh, before we have the need for a work order to come in. Not that we're not following up on work orders, we are, but taking that more proactive uh, strategy. And then I, uh, Ms. Matoya uh, joined us today for the driver appreciation um, uh, for our bus drivers today, which was fantastic. And um, Mr. Um, Awesome is, uh, Bobovich is getting, Mr. Awesome, Mr. Bobovich, I'm sorry, it's late. It's late. Uh, He's well, just, but he is awesome. <laughs> yeah, he is, he is, uh, <coughs> is getting ready for the final rollout of our one-to-one -one Chromebooks for this next year. Wow. Oh, and then of course, Mr. Trader will say something in a moment, but uh, his staff has been working very diligently on a more uh, efficient means of communicating with our sites regarding their budget preparation for next year. So it's, it's been it's been a really good spring. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to give you a little progress report. Some time ago, you'll remember that we met together to talk about um, OPEB, other post-employment benefits. Mm -hmm. And so the district has an obligation to its retirees to um, cover health and welfare for those that are eligible for that. And at the time, um, because all of your shows are rated FP, Financially Prudent, you um, gave us direction that we should study that and make an assessment. And we've done that, and we've made that assessment, and we have now since written a uh, RFP, a request for a proposal 
for OPEB trust services. And um, that has, uh, was advertised here this uh, past couple of weeks on the 18th and 25th. And we will open that RFP on May 16th and we'll come to you with a recommendation soon after that. Excellent. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Oh. Okay, I'd like to provide an update on parent school choice transfers. Um, we, as a reminder, we did have our first round that was open from January 15th through March 15th. Uh, parents who have put in applications for parent school choice transfers will be notified by May 15th, no later than. Um, if parents miss that window, we do have a second round. That second round of uh, the window will be from July 5th until August 2nd at 4 p.m. Very specific on the times. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and uh, that, that's the second window, and then we'll do a lottery for that round as well. Following that, uh, September 9th, we have a late wait list application process. So after consideration <laughs> of uh, families who had put in their requests for round one and round two, there's another opportunity to get your name onto a wait list. So it's kind of a three-step process. I believe uh, you did receive some information in regards to uh, transfers in the school district. I would like to um, give a ton of credit to Terry Russell for all of the work that she has done in working through the transfers uh, a number of different transfers that we have throughout the whole year. It is a constant piece that she puts a lot of time and effort into. Um, I don't want to go through the entire report, but I do want to touch on just a couple pieces of information that I think are um, provide some good summary information. When it comes to um, elementary and the secondary level, we currently have 2,861 students that are on a transfer in our schools. And uh, in working with Terry and talking to Terry over the years with this, um, there are some pieces that kind of guide some of this work. And uh, uh, the first one is the importance of keeping families together. And uh, we do that by allowing for uh, siblings to follow one another. That's one of the kind of the core pieces to uh, the whole process. And then another piece is we know that when uh, some of our students are um, attending a home school and the families move, but they stay within the Newport Mesa boundaries, we have something called continuing um, attendance. And this year, since August 1st, Terry has processed 361 requests just for families to be able to continue to attend the school that was originally their home school, but they transferred out of that school attendance area. So that 361 is part of the 2,861 students that are currently on transfers, but there's a lot of work that goes into it. And again, Terry Russell is simply doing an amazing job with that. I want to thank you and specifically mention the fact that Newport Mesa is an outstanding school recognizing school of choice, which was <clears throat> one of the comments of why they, the Orange County Department, Orange County Board of Education felt that it was critical that there be a charter school when we already do that. So thank you very much. Thank Terry for us too, because wow. So a couple of you have mentioned different aspects of the task force, but I just wanted to do a, a quick update. Last Wednesday night, we had our second human relations task force meeting, and at that meeting, we gave out the commitment to participate on the task force form. At the end of the meeting, 27 people turned in that form. I talked to Don and Julie today of the Orange County Human Relations Council. They've gotten a few more applications, so we're up to 35 at this oh, time. Nice. We put on the form that they had until May 1st to turn it in, so uh, they really think we'll have between 40 or 50 people at our next meeting. Uh, we really, the first two meetings have gone slow to set the groundwork to make sure that everybody on the, on the Human Relations Task Force really knew what they were in for. And so at our next meeting on May 8th, the Orange County Human Relations Council will really begin this hard work of addressing these community issues and goals to make recommendations to the board. Also, as Member Anderson said, tomorrow night uh, here in this, in the boardroom from six to eight, the Orange County Human Relations Council will be holding our first community uh, workshop about implicit bias and we're 
really excited about that. So that's kind of where those things are. And Member Matoya, uh, the Angels Scholar Award was given out um, it, the, for our AVID students. There were three of our students that were awarded. Uh, Rafael Arias Torres, as you said, from Newport Harbor High School, who will be attending Northeastern. Sophie uh, Chavez from Early College High School, who will be going to UC Irvine. Uh, Anahe Villagrana from Newport Harbor High School, who will be attending UC Santa Barbara. It's a four-year scholarship that pays for all tuition and all of their college ex expenses, including books, <coughs> room and board, supplies, Amazing. travel, and meals for four years. Amazing. So it's an Amazing. awesome Amazing. scholarship played for by Artie uh, Moreno from the Angels. It's, is this the first Amazing. time that we've gotten um, I think it's the second year of the scholarship, but we weren't awarded any of the scholarships last year. So it's the first time that our students have been awarded this scholarship. And it, I mean, it's, it's amazing. Just so the public amazing, knows, I mentioned amazing. Raphael because he's our student board member. So that's why. Thank you so much. So um, we are, as you know, uh, c concluding the best part of uh, the actual adoption process for history social studies uh, started actually last Thursday and will continue um, this Thursday. And it's through our consensus process. It's an entire day dedicated, um, you know, to teachers making the decision of what the best set of materials is after an enormous amount of work that they put into that. Um, it really is a, it's a, it's one of those days I was explaining to Dr. Navarro uh, when we went through it uh, last Thursday. I love it and I hate it. Um, <laughs> I, I love it because it's that time um, when everything comes together really for everybody. I think all the teachers realize why they put in all the work um, that they did and gathering evidence and analyzing the materials because ultimately the, the, the decision weighs in their hands and, and through voice, and through the entire process in that day, um, you know, it just all comes together in, in a decision, but, but really what comes out of it is, is everybody's able to reflect on the amount of learning that's taken place throughout the process. Um, it, it's, it's also really um, kind of a magical time for our administrative team. Um, because we really go in, it's a responsive day. We go in and don't know what's going to happen. Um, and in, in the middle of, um, you know, some serious conversations, um, you know, together, working together and just facilitating the conversation, there's also an enormous amount of leadership um, learning that goes on on that day. Um, so we're right in the throes of that. Our sixth through eighth grade team uh, met last week um, and made a decision uh, to come to you at the next board meeting um, with a report uh, that they will be recommending to you, uh, McGraw-Hill, for their set of materials. Um, our 10th, 11th, and 12th grade uh, consensus days will be Thursday. Um, and that's going to be, believe it or not, although we've done this four or five times now, a, a unique consensus experience because each of the grade levels will break up into their own consensus um, um, uh, conversation. So um, while Dr. Cox has trained us all, we cannot replace him um, in, in consensus. Uh, but I, I have asked uh, George Knights to lead our 10th grade group through the process, Vanessa Gailey, our 11th grade. And then I've tasked Dr. Cox with an, uh, another challenge, and he'll be working with our 12th grade mm -hmm. um, through the consensus process. And it's an additional challenge for him because they're actually adopting two texts. So they're going to have to go through this consensus process two times in that day. Um, so it's an exciting time. It is when everything comes together. Um, and I look forward coming back to you at the next board meeting um, with that report of recommendation for all of those grade levels. Okay, first of all, I just want, want to address uh, um, Trustee uh, Floor's request for uh, thought exchange. I uh, just want you to know that we have uh, put in uh, to give a report on May 28th. So that will be May 28th. But uh, what I wanted to share tonight was just uh, some examples of how we're building a culture of safety uh, here in the district, both uh, for schools and our workplace. Uh, these are just a few examples. But uh, not only do we have a standing item at all of our cabinet meetings and principal meetings, uh, but we've been having uh, other meetings that are part of our system. Uh, we just uh, last week met um, with the Joint Safety Committee, which uh, Britt is part of and Pam is part of, as well as some other CSEA, NMFT, and NMAA members, where we engage in uh, safety dialogue. And they're a very uh, passionate group about
about safety and it gives me an opportunity to bring ideas and for them to share ideas with me as well. Uh, another example is our Safety and Health Committee, which is a large committee and it's comprised of representatives from all of our school sites. And we meet quarterly. Uh, we actually have a meeting tomorrow, which is a little different format, where they're going to be meeting here uh, in the assembly room. And we're actually going to go over our district-wide EOC, e -E EOC operations. And we're going to have them tour our emergency operations center, as well as our secondary operations center. And we're going to display our mobile emergency team van and equipment all set up. So they can s picture what that looks like if we have to deploy them and they show up at a school site. Uh, another thing that uh, we're very excited is that uh, we have an arrangement with Brenda Emmerich, who is from the Costa Mesa Fire Department, mm -hmm. and she will be uh, giving training, a full day training it's called the School Preparedness Academy. Uh, there will be two sessions, one on April 29th, one on May 8th. We have 30 participants already signed up for each of those uh, sessions, one represented, at least one representative from every school site as well as the, the workplace. Uh, and then we're going to have a session just for administrators during the summer, so that's uh, well underway. And the last thing I'm very excited about, at our last principal meeting, we had a lieutenant from the Costa Mesa Police Department who wanted to talk to all of our principals about coy coyote awareness. Yeah. Evidently, this is coyote season right now, yeah, yeah. so it's very, very timely. And not only did he give a, a very brief but concise training about coyote, coyotes, what to do, what not to do, uh, he handed out a great resource that they put together for kids on coyote awareness and had this available for all of our principals and distributed coyote noisemakers, <laughs> which I actually had one to demonstrate, but I left it in the conference room. Uh, but it's a, a can that you shake to scare away the coyote uh, safely from a, from a distance. Um, it's a secret. Oh. No. It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's, it's actually crazy. anything hard, like you can put coins in there or a battery, but, but you shake it and it Washers. is quite loud and it scares oh. the coyote away. So, uh, so I just want to assure you we are making progress uh, day by day, uh, again, trying to build this culture and maintain a culture of safety for our kids. Cool. Thank you. So last board meeting, I had to follow Sue the tsunami. Remember yes, his, his yes. children's thing about the tsunami, and now yes. I get to file, follow yes. um, Cody the coyote or whatever <laughs> it is. So um, just a couple of things from from our division. One is uh, we had a autism resource event, uh, and it was at Harper put on by um, Kristen Henry, our autism coordinator and the autism specialist. And we, it was a fabulous event. We had several vendors coming. So we had um, Seegerstrom, we had uh, Judo, we had Autism by the Sea, um, just probably at least 15 different vendors there. And then we had um, two presentations and one was a, uh, a mom and a student who, um, he has autism and uh, they found his passion and that was cooking and so he <laughs> created um, Julian's awesome sauce with an AU mm -hmm. for autism and one of the, like his flavors was like nonverbal herbal you know <laughs> and so um, but just kind of talking about how you know to parents how you can help your kids even if they uh, you know have a different disability and what things they can do and then the other presentation was a um, like a re registered dietitian, and you know, students with autism often have really sensory food issues. And she has this program called Eight the Plate, like the number eight. And she has this plate that's sectioned off into eight sections, and it's like you do a desired <laughs> food, then a less desired food, then this, and then you. And it was really interesting. And I thought, oh, that would work for you know, like babies too, yeah. or for you know, husbands or whoever <laughs> you know, you need to get to eat different things. But um, it was um, it was a it was Don't a great event, and and um, and then I wanted to give you one glimpse, kind of behind the curtains, um, and something that you really don't often hear about, and that is, um, you know, we serve uh, a lot of preschool students in special education, and we serve some of them in our special day class programs, and we serve a lot of students who are in 
uh, regular preschool programs in our district that, you know, they're part of either a fee-based program or a state preschool or something else. And one of the things we do this time of year is we really um, try and plan for what those transition IEPs are going to look like as they move into <coughs> kindergarten. Where are they going to go to school? You know, it's a very um, scary time for parents in general, let alone parents of a child with special needs. So um, we had um, 14 preschool teachers and 18 receiving like SAI teachers, you know, specialized academic instruction um, at the elementary sites who have met to plan about each individual student. And they will use that information then as they're, when they hold these IEP meetings with families so that they can say, well, I understand, you know, I know what Kaiser, you know, look, well, maybe not Kaiser, I know what, uh, you know, Woodland Kindergarten looks like. I know what, you know, Heights Kindergarten looks like. And uh, they've, they've worked all that out. And so it's just really fabulous. They get subs and they, they have it all set up so that they're doing these rotations of meeting with all these folks. So That's it really great. is a, a helpful thing for, for kids and families as they're moving through that first transition in the district. Thank you. That's good. Wow. Thank you for the reports. I was going oh to say God. that. Thank you for the reports. It was really good. I'm sorry it's late, but it was worth waiting for. <laughs> well, consider that on the agenda at the next agenda. Um, do I? Uh, I um, move. Um, I move to adjourn the meeting. Thank you, Mrs. Snow. You're welcome. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we'll adjourn the meeting at 10:05.